Hello and welcome to the Dave the Doctor and Podcast 19. Woohoo! Whee! 19! Oh, episode 19. <laughs> That's it. Are we recording right now? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah oh. We've been recording for the last minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Cool. <laughs> Fantastic. Hello. Great. great. <gasps> uh, <laughs> directly. You got to talk like directly into it, though. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can you say something in yours real quick? Hi. Say it again. Hello. <laughs> Hang on. One more time. I like dogs. All right, perfect. <laughs> All right, what's going on? We're two days after the last one. Yeah. How you no, feeling, Josh? Feeling great. <laughs> I uh, took the last 48 hours to just put down the hammer on the last podcast, and it will be up today at noon. Which will is Thursday, but you you won't hear this until Monday. So whatever. It's weird <laughs> thinking of the timeline. Not skipping a week. Not skipping a week. <laughs> uh, today we're joined with Krista and Bridget of MK9T. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. It's like what's MK9T? <laughs> <laughs> I like MK9 better. MK9. Yeah. yeah. Krista was supposed to be on uh, like three episodes ago, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, the world blew up. The world blew up. And then, um, yeah. And then she was supposed to come back the next day. And uh, she, I bailed. She <laughs> bailed. <laughs> she bailed on us. So now she had to bring Bridget with her to feel better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. What's going on, guys? Not much. Training dogs. Living life. <laughs> Training dogs. <laughs> living life. I, I hate being asked what's up. Nothing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, today we're going to be doing a nice random podcast. What did you call it earlier? Hot takes. The hot no. takes. Is it yeah. hot takes? Yeah. Hot takes. Bridget's hot takes. <laughs> On the hot spot with Bridget. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Something like there. that. Under the fire. That's what it was. Yeah. 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 Rapid fire. Rapid we're going to have lots of questions. rapid fire dog topics today. Mm-hmm. She brought a giant notebook. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Is that a doodle notebook? Yes, it Supposed was my to doodle aunt's, in it? but now it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> your questions. Uh, it's a lot. Oh my gosh. Well, before we get into that, um, God, I feel like I feel like we just wrapped two days ago, so there's not a whole lot of nonsense to talk about before. There, there really isn't, which is fine. So I guess we can get right into stuff. So today we got topics over there. Mm-hmm. We got a couple questions in here, and we're gonna burn through stuff. So yeah, we're not gonna waste time. Let's jump into things. Do you want to do the questions first? Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Have Krista. All right. Answer. Yeah, I got a question for Krista here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here we go. I got this text message the other day from <laughs> Willow's owner, ah. Riley. It's a long one. You ready? <clears throat> Interesting question slash scenario for your next podcast. How do we approach going on walks, socializing with other dogs that don't have any structured training? For example, I've been trying to socialize my dog with one of my friends. She had a golden doodle. Had or has? Nice dog, but no training. So no concept of yes and no, healing, walking nicely, etc. If we wanted to go walking trail, if we wanted to go to a walking trail, would I effectively ignore her dog and still enforce my dog's rules when walking? My question is that my dog gets high strung that taking her on a walk with another dog would cause frustration being on a leash when there's another dog that is just walking around and sniffing freely. Uh, This one's really easy. Don't associate with people who have untrained dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Wow. Uh, um, uh, I mean, yeah, you're going to have friends with dogs that aren't trained, you know, but your dog's still held accountable Mm -hmm. in all those situations. I would look at it as any other distraction. You're on a walk, the other dog's next to you, whatever, sniffing, doing whatever it wants to. Uh, Willow is still required to be in a heel. So I would just look at it as any other distraction and enforce a heel with her. As for socializing with another dog, you don't really have, I mean, if you don't have any way to add structure to playtime, um, you kind of just have to let some of those things go <clears throat> or get the dog trained. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. What are you no, smiling was good. at me for? That was good. That was good. <laughs> okay. I, I look at stuff like that like uh like is it 
Is it an ex- if you're walking down the street and there's dog across the street yeah. that's pulling and lunging and barking? Is that an excuse for you to your dog to start pulling, barking, and yeah. lunging? Yeah. No. no. Right. What if that dog is twenty feet away? Yeah. Is it still? No. No. What if that dog is five feet away? No. No. Right. So. No matter what the rules are for the other dog, your dog's rules don't change. Yeah. yeah. So you enforce them all the same. Yeah. Now, that being said, going for a walk with another dog in general, I think there's kind of a mentality that establishes if you're out for a walk with another dog or another person and another dog or whatever it may be, where after the first couple minutes, they kind of realize they're with each other the novelty of it goes away Mm -hmm. and all the dogs kind of chill out organically from that Mm -hmm. right i mean look at pack walks right they got that freaking shaker heights pack walk on the east side Mm -hmm. have you seen are you familiar with that yeah 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 they do like 120 dogs Mm -hmm. holy shit yeah seriously just absolute chaos are any of them actually trained though some of them a lot of local trainers have started using it like Like, i know lorenzo's takes dogs there it's ran by two trainers Mm -hmm. i believe columbia dog training as well as uh uh uh, chris ramsey which is like the shaker heights dog academy or whatever Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but it's also open to the public. So like anybody can bring their dog. And if you follow their Facebook page, like people post in it all the time. Like I saw this one, I think yesterday. We should go. Let's, let's, let's take Vinny and Duke. It's not good. Um, (laughs) Tooney wouldn't be the best. Here we go. Here we go. Where is it? Somebody asked one day ago. Hello. This is in the Shaker Heights pack walk group. Hello, everybody. I'm bringing my dog for his first walk, but I'm a bit hesitant. He has never been around so many dogs at once and can be aggressive with other dogs. Any suggestions for dominant alpha type dogs? The walk seems like it may be a great opportunity for him to see dogs behaving appropriately. (laughs) (laughs) What was it like the first walk? I love when owners are like, oh, if my dog sees another dog doing it, they'll follow suit. And it's like, no. Learn from the other one. (laughs) Yeah. But anyways, the fact of the matter is, like, listen, like, we could have a whole conversation about the pack walk and if it's a good idea or a bad idea or what, but the fact of the matter is all these untrained dogs go there, and yeah, for the first, like, 20 minutes of it, it's just dogs freaking out, losing Mm -hmm. their minds, stuff Mm -hmm. like that, and then a good majority of them just kind of fall into the groove of, like, we're in a large group of dogs, Mm -hmm. and we're kind of past Mm -hmm. it, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I think walking with other dogs is very similar. We have a lot of clients that have... Uh, reactive dogs that will go and walk with other dogs, mm-hmm. other friends' dogs and stuff. And I think it's beneficial for them, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I don't think anything changes, Yeah. right? Now, I would not be trying to use it as a means of socializing the dogs, right? If you're going to go mm-hmm. for a walk with another dog, go for a walk with the other dog mm-hmm. and you guys yeah. both keep your dogs under control as mm-hmm. best as you can. Um, but, you know, really, if they're on the leash, there shouldn't be a whole lot of interacting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that being said... I have gone on hikes with friends before where we let the dogs off leash and we'll use that as an opportunity to socialize the dogs together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that can be beneficial because there's so many outside distractions going on. The dogs aren't going to be as hyper fixated on each other, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's not going to be as intense of this like social meeting as you would see in like a little play session in like a yard or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you see out in, like, when you're in California or in New York, were there a lot of pack walks and stuff? Was that a big thing? I probably wasn't as aware of them as I am now, if I were to see them. Um, I'm sure in California there was a lot more, but I wasn't really into following many trainers out there, so mm-hmm. I don't know. But we used to do that in upstate New York. We used to do... Um, it wasn't open to the public, but pack walks or group classes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the pack walk? <laughs> um, I uh, I uh, think a lot of people go into it hoping it'll solve issues or expose their dog to things properly, but they go into it without any training to control their dog in such a overstimulating um, situation. Mm, mm-hmm. And I would, if I were to do a pack walk, I would first want to know, do I have control over my dog and do I have some training so I can apply it to this situation? That's going to be overstimulating. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be great if, if you had like some foundation first, but Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 120 dogs though. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's a lot. That's insane. Like I've seen it a couple of times I've been doing, they do it around like Shaker Lakes on the east side. 
And I used to do lessons at Shaker Lakes all the time. And there would be a couple of times I was doing a lesson and then heard the pack walk mm-hmm. coming from around the corner. And it's just this parade yeah. of dogs. It's Were just they all insane nuts. or were they pretty chill? Hit or miss. I yeah. mean, like I said, you got trained dogs, you got untrained dogs, yeah. you got kind of trained dogs, you got trainers, you yeah. got it's all sorts of stuff. Insane. Yeah. You know? It's probably more a hot mess at that volume. I would agree. Yeah. Right? Like, I think there are probably people out there that are doing it in a somewhat beneficial way. Like, yeah. Anna, for example, right? Like, she has a pack walk she was doing for a little bit or is still doing. I'm not sure. Yeah. Where it was, like, smaller groups. I'm pretty sure she had, like, five to ten dogs at it or something like yeah. that. And I'm pretty sure they were all trained dogs by yeah. her. So she had a little bit more control over mm-hmm. who all is coming to it, right? Where it's not going to be counterproductive, at least. Yeah. Um, I, did, I had the conversation the other day with uh, Nina and Tucker's owner. She was asking, she was like, oh, because she was talking about how she used to take Tucker to, there's another pack walk on the west side, um, like Elite K911 does like a pack walk or whatever, right? And she's like, yeah, I used to take him there, uh, and he did all right, whatever. She's like, should I take him back, this, that? or And then she started asking, she's like, you know, are you ever planning on doing like a pack walk or something? And I was kind of thinking about it, and I... <sighs> I think, in theory, they're a good idea, no different than a group training class is a good idea from the standpoint of once your dog's trained, you got a place to work on some stuff with some distractions and be around a group of people that are, uh, you know, of the same mind and doing the same things and stuff like that. I think from a training standpoint of just, like, getting your dog out and about to different distractions, I think it's good. Um, That being said, I don't think that they're as productive as everybody thinks they are. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, like you said, people think they're going to solve issues. Mm -hmm. They think they're going to help socialize their dog. They think Mm -hmm. it's going to be a good place Mm -hmm. for them to go uh, get their dog past reactivity and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is you can do that outside of a pack walking setting, right? And in some cases, some of these larger pack walks or less controlled ones, I think are more counterproductive because... You figure like reactivity in particular, right? It comes from that stress of the dog feeling trapped, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You stick a reactive dog right in the middle of 50 dogs in front of them and 50 dogs behind them. How is that relieving any sort of sense of feeling trapped? Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that's the thing I don't get about it is they stick them like right in the middle where like there's a dog three feet in front of them, three feet behind them. Like, and then again, like 50 plus going both ways. Yeah. And it's like, that's got to be the most stressful yeah. feeling ever to someone. I probably would trapped. be stressed. Yeah, yeah. are you I kidding me? I feel trapped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you figure you got some of these dogs that may be working through issues, you know, that are, you know, lunging at some of them and things like that. It's just, mm-hmm. I really think it makes it worse mm-hmm. in some of those cases. So if I were to ever do it, it would be more of a group setting type thing. And I would mm-hmm. not be doing it with the advertisement that this is going to solve all your dog's issues. It yeah. would just be kind of a fun mm-hmm. little extracurricular thing yeah. to be able mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. Because when I used to run group group classes, like looking back, they were not productive at all. Yeah. The dogs, one, weren't really well trained. And two, we weren't really holding them to a higher standard, like in those sessions. And it was just spread so thin between Mm -hmm. 15 people that you can't really work on anything, any issues in that setting, you know? Yeah. You kind of have to go into it with groundwork, I think, or some foundation. Yeah, I think group settings is another one where, you know, people go into it with the same expectation as like the pack walk where they think they're going to train their dog in the group setting and do all this kind of stuff where that's not going to happen. But it can be a cool extracurricular thing once your dog is already trained, Mm -hmm. you know, no different than daycare lets us keep our eyes on the dog and interact with the owner from time to time and keep the communication open. Mm -hmm. I think the group setting is similar, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Do you ever do any group classes or anything? Um, when I was like little, I did a when class. you were little, yeah. When I was a child, I did a <laughs> pet smart class with my dog Stevie. Stevie, oh. and their was motto, it a Chihuahua? No, it was an Akita. Oh, but Akita. Um, their motto was "Kiss, keep it simple, stupid," mm-hmm. and it was just about <laughs> keeping everything really simple with dog How old training. were you? Middle school. Yeah. Um, but it was like clicker training. So all the people would be clicking their dog training things at different times. And the dogs, it was just a mess. And the dog was terribly trained. (laughs) I didn't get anything out of that. (laughs) Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) What was that? dog festival thing that was in oh, Lakewood. Spooky Pooch Parade. Yeah. What? what? That slaps. I, I, I'm a big <laughs> Spooky Pooch Parade person. Yeah. But Did you dress Toonie up? I 
didn't put a lot of effort into it the first year, but now with COVID, it was canceled last year. Mm-hmm. So this year, yeah, yes, we're going to do. Actually, my client actually won that competition. Mm-hmm. I think she got a year free of dog food. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah. But there was, it was I just Toy remember Story. seeing there was quite a few dogs there that were yeah. just like, what is going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and then they're like, oh, if I don't set, set. And he's just like. And Fido's like, in like yeah. a sweater, yeah, like, like, yeah, with like, dressed up like a horse. And he's yeah. like, "What is going yeah, on?" Yeah, has no idea what is going on. Yeah, that's just like another one of those situations. It's just like mm-hmm. you should probably, I don't know, think about what you're putting your dog into <laughs> before you take it there. Does mm-hmm. anybody name their dog Fido anymore? I don't know. Mm. I'm just old, I guess. Yeah. It's like I want to meet. Thing. If there's a Fido in Cleveland, I'll train it for free. Yeah, I actually haven't met a Fido <laughs> ever. <laughs> I will. Someone's going to name their dog Fido for free training. I need like a birth certificate. A birth, <laughs> birth certificate. Okay. Stating this is your real name. Social security card would do. Fido. All right. Next question. This one's from Ellie. Ellie? Ellie Beltran. Huh. Hello. I have another question slash topic for your podcast. P.S. Thanks for asking, answering all of my precious questions. You're welcome. You're welcome. My question is regarding dog socialization and introductions. From your previous content and common sense, most of the don'ts are pretty obvious. Don't do leashed introductions. Don't have high reward objects around. Treats toys affection. Don't unnecessarily insert yourself into the interaction. But what are the do's for dog socialization with the other dogs, particularly when it comes to first introductions? When do you correct for rude behavior towards other dogs? For example, if a dog constantly comes in hot, high, stiff tail, chest, and ears forward, do you correct for that posturing right away? If a dog is playing and it becomes more rough and isn't being reciprocated, do you correct for that behavior so that it does not progress? Side note, this question partially stems from an experience with my own dog a few months ago. I took him on an off-leash walk with my cousin's dog. They were both playing a bit rough and chasing each other back and forth, but the play wasn't reciprocated. I wasn't paying attention for the first few minutes, and my cousin and I heard terrible fight noises, and they were fighting head to head. My cousin's dog did not have a scratch on her, but my dog ended up with a ripped ear and a few small punctures around the neck. The dogs had spent time together six times prior with no issues, inside hangs. Uh, Outside hangs and walks, and on and off leash. So a lot of socialization. Neither dog had been in a fight prior or since. My dog had his e-collar on, of course, but the interaction made me wary of play and how it can quickly turn and made me question when I should intervene to prevent this from happening. Thanks in advance. Do you know what dog this is? No, this is not a dog we trained. Oh. What do you think? Do's for socialization. When do we insert our... I I think that's really the question more than anything. Mm -hmm. It's not what are the do's because it's really about the don'ts. The dogs decide the do's. Yeah. You know? I think a lot of people get nervous when they see like the posturing and stuff and they want to interrupt it to just stop the dog Mm -hmm. versus like seeing what is the dog really going to do? Because I don't know, I see a lot of dogs that come in hot and they kind of posture a little bit, get real stiff, but that's just how they move initially. Mm -hmm. And as they start getting more comfortable, they start opening up when you correct that too quick without really knowing what the dog's going to do, then you're shutting the dog down and they're not going to learn to Mm -hmm. open up in socialization right mm-hmm. i think i would correct commitment oh. oh i think we're good let me check hold on that happened the other day i can't hear you yeah, you can oh can you yeah you weren't talking in your mic then i guess <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's no, going on now i can't oh fuck me the thing that- all right we're recording again <laughs> It's a weak soccer. Krista hit the, the, the <laughs> headphone jack. It's a weak yeah. soccer. <laughs> a weak socket. All right, socialization. Back to it. Um, do I have to restart? Or? No, 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 no. We heard oh. everything you said. Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, if I were to correct, it would just be commitment. But in play, if it's not mutual and the dog is kind of antagonizing the other one and it's not being reciprocated then I I would probably step in and correct. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I don't know. What are your thoughts? So like if one dog's just like really overzealous? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of. If the other one's being a little too pushy and the other one's definitely not into it mm-hmm. or moving away or giving a little snap and the other mm-hmm. one's not reading those cues, mm-hmm. then I think it is up to us to correct that dog for not reading those cues. Mm-hmm. I agree. 
Okay, I have a couple notes here. So first and foremost, it sounds like these dogs had interacted a lot before, but one thing that I've always abided by when I'm introducing a dog to new dogs is keeping it slow and short, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Mm -hmm. I don't know what the context of this was, but I see a lot of people make the mistake of they will get two dogs together that may have been together enough times, right? But the dogs are hanging out for the entire time the humans are hanging out, Mm -hmm. right? It's like two hours, three hours, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. When we're introducing new dogs, I personally try to keep it short, right? I keep it around the 30 minute mark and I keep it really structured from the standpoint of supervised, ready to address things when started, Mm -hmm. uh, not running into a situation like you said in this post where, you know, we weren't paying attention and then we heard the fighting sounds. Mm -hmm. You should never run into that situation, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if this is a new place you were in with the dogs, right? Because it could have been anything, right? In this scenario, maybe one of the dogs picked up a stick off of the ground and started chewing it mm-hmm. and then started resource guarding that stick, mm-hmm. right? I don't know. I've seen Deli do that when we first moved in here, mm-hmm. right? Where she'd pick up sticks in the yard, she'd start chewing them, and if one of the dogs tried to go over to her, she'd kind of show her teeth at them and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to catch any of those things as soon as they mm-hmm. start to make sure that it doesn't turn into a problem. Because yes, you could physically not have dog toys and dog treats and stuff like that but there are things in the environment that the dog will perceive as reinforcing that they will try to guard as well you have to be aware of that what did you do with Dolly? did you correct Correct that yeah yeah, yeah, for sure did you correct her for taking the stick or did you correct her for guarding when she started guarding it oh yeah yeah, yeah. did she just stop she stopped after that yeah and she kind of stopped playing with the sticks in general which i don't really have a problem with yeah you can go either way like uh henry Brittany's dog Mm -hmm. um we, we did a session at the park one time because he would resource guard the fish, <laughs> the dead fish on the ground. I think she told yeah. me that once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Literally, we took him there. And uh, that was his big thing. It was like dog aggression issues. <laughs> yeah, right? And, the, you know, in Edgewater Beach, there's dead fish yeah. all over it. It's disgusting. He found this big ass fish and went over and like hovered over it. And another dog came up near him and he full on... Ah! <laughs> oh my God. I told him no. Henry. Nailed his ass like as high as the e-collar went. He ran away from that fish, and they still tell me Henry has never went near a fish since that time. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One time, that's it. One time, right? <laughs> but again. again, environmental things that the dog will perceive as reinforcing that if you're not watching and you don't realize something mm-hmm. like that can happen, it can turn into a problem, mm-hmm. right? So um, that's, you know, I don't know exactly what the scenario was, obviously, but but you want to keep it slow and short so that you could supervise it as intensely as you need to be, mm-hmm. right? Honestly, If the dog is not a member of your immediate household, there should never be a time your eyes are not on them, Mm -hmm. right? Because they don't have, they don't have that hierarchy established like my dogs do in the house or your dogs do or whatever it may be, Mm -hmm. right? They don't have that where one will back down Mm -hmm. if the other pushes on them or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're constantly in a state of competition. And that's why when you set up play dates, the dogs typically are really intense with each other with the plays because they're still competing. They're still figuring Mm -hmm. that out, Mm -hmm. right? The second thing would be understanding the dog, right? So the big thing that was mentioned here was the posturing and stuff like that. And you hit this on the head where most dogs, when they meet other dogs, get stiff and posturing Mm -hmm. because play Mm -hmm. is competition and that's how they do that, right? They do that type of stuff no differently than mounting, no differently than all these other things. The key is not we have to stop that stuff. The key is understanding how far your dog will take it and how the other dog will respond when your dog does those things, Mm -hmm. right? And we've talked about this numerous times in socialization. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop a dog from doing something like that. That's a social butterfly dog Mm -hmm. because the other dog is going to respond negatively to it, Mm -hmm. right? Because the Mm -hmm. problem is not the dog that's doing it. The problem is the dog that's responding negatively to Mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. Um. So you have to understand the dogs you're socializing with. And sometimes you don't know that until you put them in that scenario. And you have to kind of play it out and see what's going to happen and be prepared to address it if it turns into Mm -hmm. a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think 90% of socialization issues, whether with dogs or people, come from us not understanding our dog's social Mm -hmm. skills, right? So that's another part of it is understanding your dog's triggers so you know where you have to correct, right? Vinny's a postury dog. Like yesterday, him and Deli were playing, and they do the same thing. They do the chest puffed out, ears forward, quick. Yeah. It's hilarious, you know? (laughs) And that's what they do, right? It's not a problem, right? There are other dogs that when they do that posturiness, it actually is a, Mm -hmm. I'm about to attack you, Mm -hmm. right? And you need to know that sign as well. Yeah. 
uh, the reciprocating thing you kind of hit on with this, right? There are definitely times that I will correct for a dog not responding to cues, right? That Doberman mm-hmm. I did the assessment with the other day, mm-hmm. right? Super, super, super social dog, right? Year old Doberman, very, very friendly, very rambunctious, mm-hmm. right? Big dog too, right? And I let her out with, uh, it was Queenie and uh, da 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 da. Oh yeah, Queenie, Vera, and one other dog. Dolly. You had no, Dolly it wasn't out. Dolly. Not for this one. I had Dolly out with uh, Franklin. What was mm-hmm. it with Franklin? Um, and same deal. She was playing so hard and just pissing the other dogs off, right? They were all turning around, like snapping at her and trying to get her to stop and stuff like that. And she's just like, oh my God, we're around other dogs, <laughs> right? At, at one point, I chose to correct for that because she just was pushing so intensely and so hard and the other dogs were getting so pissed off about mm-hmm. it, right? And it wasn't like, I don't think a fight would have broken out, but like it would have res- it would have resulted in one of those dogs really needing to correct her mm-hmm. in order for her to stop, which at that point, like I'll just do it myself, mm-hmm. right? So I would teach dogs how to respond to those cues. And we talked about this the other day with that one question about the multi-dog household, yeah. where I'll only do it once the one dog has committedly tried to stop the other dog multiple times mm-hmm. and the other dog shows no sign of backing down mm-hmm. at all. Right. Then I will step in and give a correction after that dog corrects that. Yeah. Dog. Out of curiosity, like on that of like us teaching dogs <laughs> to respond to the other dog's cues. Do you think that any of any timing has to be in play with that for the dog to really understand? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has to come. Dog I mean, you're conditioning snaps. it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dog snaps. Dog doesn't respond. We correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we start conditioning in after this dog snaps. If you don't stop, we're going to correct. You. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're literally classically conditioning that cue. Yeah. Um, then the next one would be dogs just getting annoying in general. Right. So I talk a lot about letting things really slide. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm pretty loose about that kind of stuff. I want the dogs for the most part to figure it out. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, there are times that I correct my dogs for playing with each other because it's annoying me. Mm-hmm. Right when they're in the house and rough housing and we're trying to chill out and watch a movie or eat or cook or whatever it may be, they just need to stop. Mm-hmm. Right. But do you sometimes let them do that or is it, Hey, when we're chilling out, I, tr- the- I try to keep it black and white of mm-hmm. no rough housing in the house mm. so that it's a little bit more fair if I correct for mm-hmm. it. And then if it's outside, you know, outside I tend to keep it, you could be as high energy as you want out yeah. there. I don't particularly care. I'll typically use a command or something to stop them. Do they point. interact in the house that much? Not really. Yesterday was honestly the first time in a long time. Like I said, like Deli and Vinny started playing. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so sometimes when they're getting annoying, it's not wrong to give a correction for it if you want them to stop. And I think that helps them learn, you know, this is a conversation of like using obedience versus just correcting for it. I think that it helps them learn a little bit of a cutoff cue for it where like once it hits this point, I'm going to correct you where mm-hmm. once they start hitting that point, they kind of start checking in, mm-hmm. you know, uh, as opposed to needing to be like kind of managed with the obedience commands and stuff. Um, and then the last part of it kind of goes with that is when I'm socializing dogs with other dogs in general, I will occasionally test the dogs to see how in tune with me they are. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I talk about this a lot when I'm socializing dogs. I'm okay with play getting real, real wild mm-hmm. with the assumption that if I need to, I could stop it on a dime. Mm-hmm. Right. So, in order to to do that, I need to make sure that I have their attention still. So sometimes when they're roughhousing and stuff like that, I'll say something, whether it's a name or I'll give a command or something. And then if I don't get an immediate response to that, I'll just give a correction, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I start teaching them that my verbal cues need to be paid attention to at all times, mm-hmm. right? So that's something else you could do that mm-hmm. also helps to keep the dogs with one year turn to you mm-hmm. where you're not going to run into as many situations like that. Mm-hmm. Right. So those are kind of my dues, I guess, as far as socialization of where I will intervene and how I will intervene. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think that's good. Follow up points. No, but I, I guess for like uh, owners that don't have any tools on their dog, mm-hmm. how are you suggesting for them to create that? You can't. 
Really? It's very difficult to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you're kind of leaving. <laughs> this is what you're doing when you do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Fingers like, crossed. Please don't get into it with yeah. each other. Mm-hmm. Right? You can keep a leash on the dog in case you need to go over and grab it or something like that, you know? But you you have to have some sort of communication. Yeah. You, you just have, you know what I mean? Like yeah. spray bottle with water. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, that's, uh, you know, a spray bottle. <laughs> get the we used to use a lot of those. Um, yeah. They're effective with some dogs for sure. Rocks you know? in a A little bottle. dart gun. If pennies like in a, a jar little... or whatever, mm. pennies in a bottle. So something to interrupt mm. the dogs. But again, you need to get into then the understanding of how do I apply a consequence for something? Mm-hmm. You know, how do I punish a behavior? Things like that. So yeah. there's a lot of ways to do it, but no matter what, those are even training things, right? Yeah. They require an understanding of training to use, yeah. you know, mm. you could shake your jar of rocks all day long, mm-hmm. but if it's not clear <laughs> what it's for, <laughs> yeah. spark! <laughs> yeah. No, she just lets them fight it out. I do. Yeah. I let a lot of things go between my dogs just to see how it plays out. And it always just one backs down and I don't have to step in and... It's like because a little war they zone. have that relationship established. Yeah. With you. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there, there is a big, big difference between dogs living in the same house and you socializing your dog with outside dogs. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you ever get your dogs with other dogs? Do you have like friends that have dogs or anything? Um, my Doof. friends, yeah, yeah. Duke comes over. Um, <laughs> my friends do have dogs that when they visit, they'll bring their dog, um, and they'll just play. Mm-hmm. And everything works out. Well, her mom's dog, Benny. Do oh, you remember yeah. that dog that you sure do? <laughs> He's, He's over there. Now. Nice. <laughs> and he keeps going after Tooney. And I was just like, Mom, you're going to put an e-collar on this dog because he keeps just, Tooney's doing nothing. And he, Did he, he tried to after. bite Doof too, I think. Yes. He tries to bite everybody. Mm. Dang. 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 Who, who's the, uh, the alpha small dog? Tooney. Nelson. What? Nelson. Nelson is the king of the house. He <laughs> rules everything. <laughs> and then I would say Minnow, Spork. No, you're just choosing favorite. Mm-mm. You don't <laughs> think Toonie runs your house? Toonie's corrects a lot, corrects the dogs a lot, but she's kind of like senile, so it's like... <laughs> what is she really doing? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the grandpa that sits in the chair yeah. sleeping every now and then gets up like, why are you guys doing? <laughs> that's yeah. that's, that's Toonie. Toonie. <laughs> and I'd say wow. bottom. Then falls right back asleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> star is the star or Sunday or bottom dog. Yeah. Bottom tier. They're too chill. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Any last notes on that question? Oh, no. I think that's all of them. Uh, okay. You got it list of Bridget's questions. All right, let's get into some more. We're yeah. half hour in. We're we, we're yeah. getting right we, into it today. There's we, no <laughs> no time for fluff. Mm-hmm. No time for we, it. Wait, you should hold that up for the camera. This is Which camera? Right here. This camera. I got some beautiful Are they all on just page? one question or one oh, page? Oh. oh, I got another page somewhere. She has here. some sketches too. That's my aunt. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oh my! Wow, I love it. We have two pages. Two Are we pages. going over spelling errors or no? Oh. Not today. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's let's start with okay. So so, what's where are these questions deriving from? You know, like what's kind of uh, give us some some background on all of this. Okay, so a lot of it, I'm very into TikTok and TikTok. Dog trainers are blowing up right now. Blowing up. It's very popular on TikTok. Um, multiple dog trainers um, speaking out about different things. So it's just like this constant, like sc- I scroll a lot through TikTok. And I'm like, wait, is that a good point? Is that a bad point? Like there's positive only trainers. There's really heavy handed trainers and there's balanced trainers. And in the TikTok world, there's this huge fight between balanced trainers and positive only tra- force free training. And it's just like a constant toxic environment on TikTok, I would say. I would say it's everywhere, too. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. for sure. Um, And then a lot of call ex-colleagues I have, like, well, I still follow them on social media and the things Mm. that they'll post about positive only things start to like I question um, my own training style. Like, oh, is that a good point? Or mm-hmm. is that not a good point? So as I'm learning training and to be a better trainer, I'm kind of like touching on all these topics to see if they work. And mm-hmm. it's good to get your guys' advice on like different things because you're more experienced than I am. Um, so I've seen a lot lately that I have, have questions about. And yeah. 
I think it's really important to at all times be able to objectively look at what Mm -hmm. you're doing and understand what everybody else is doing, Mm -hmm. right? Whether you like it or not. Like one of the books I always recommend for dog trainers to read is uh, Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog, Mm -hmm. right? So it's a positive, heavily positive only book. It's Mm -hmm. all about why you should not essentially correct your dog Mm -hmm. right Uh, and why there's better ways to do it and though i don't completely agree with it there are points that are very interesting Mm -hmm. you know well i also think no matter what stance you have you have to know your opposing your opposer's stance Mm -hmm. too pretty Mm -hmm. from all standpoints i used to uh there's and there's so many now that I've, i've lost track a little bit of it but i used to know basically every single local cleveland trainer's like training style, Mm -hmm. right? And the reason why I felt like that was so important and it was so important for me to stay like up to date with that is because when we would get dogs in that had been to this trainer or this trainer or this trainer, I would immediately be able to look at that situation and be like, this is likely why this didn't work Mm -hmm. or this is likely why this didn't work because I would essentially be able to find some of the holes in that training style, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, And that's from balanced trainers as well, you Mm -hmm. know? A lot of the e-collar trainers and stuff out there are some of the biggest culprits of it, Mm -hmm. you know, and not understanding some of the more important, like, science-y side of things, uh, which results in issues or or a lack Mm -hmm. of, like, long-term success with things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I think that's good. So... Well, well, um, it's kind of what we were talking about with the... When we went over that one doctor's... Kind oh of, yeah, yeah. The positive. What Did was you see that name? one? Doctor Sophia Yin. Yeah, Sophia mm-hmm. Yin. But we were just like reading through her, mm-hmm. like in little introductory thing, and picking out the positives of it. You know, because she's a very positive only. Mm-hmm. Um, she's one of like the. So she is uh, one of the first slash most popular veterinarian behaviorists that mm-hmm. existed before she passed. Um, and she has like a whole website with like articles and blogs and stuff. And she had one that was called like, uh, 14 questions I get asked as a dog trainer or something like that. Right. And we looked at it objectively, not from the standpoint of how do we, you know, what things do I hate about this or why is she wrong with all of her answers or anything? Mm -hmm. We actually looked for it. We made a fucking list of points on it. We agreed with or disagreed with Mm -hmm. and, we agreed with far more than we disagreed with mm-hmm. on it, right? And I think that's important because if you could look at somebody that has such a conflicting style to what you do, mm-hmm. right? And you could find the similarities, right? And you could find what things are we saying that are the same, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know those things are the important things. Those mm-hmm. are the things that if we could all agree on those, there's some truth behind mm-hmm. that, right? Because all sides are saying that, right? Yeah. Uh, and you could emphasize those things more heavily and push those on your clients more understanding that they're so important, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that stuff is really good. Yeah. I, I mean, it was it just shows that everyone's trying to have the same goal. Mm-hmm. It's just taking different paths yeah. to get there yep. and finding out which paths should intersect mm-hmm. and which ones take you off the wrong way, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so we'll treat these like uh, just like topic points. Mm-hmm. So we'll start with one. We'll discuss it a little, move on to the next. Okay. What we got? Um, the first thing I'm seeing a lot on the TikTok, the internet, is constant enrichment with dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, dogs that are constantly being enriched by like toys, treats, all these different contraptions that they've invented now. Um, and like clients will ask me like well i can get her this bone but she doesn't like this bone or i'll get her this or i tried the treat ball and it doesn't work and i was like when are you using enrichment as a band-aid rather than just having your dog be trained like um do i does my dog constantly have to be doing something being enriched by something does their brain constantly have to be simulated by treats toys things like that um and it's very popular right now Mm -hmm. um There's, like, videos on different, like, putting um, tennis balls in a muffin tin and hiding kibble under there. Um, Kongs, constant, like, bones and treats. And, like, I just got a Kong wobbler for my dog Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how she eats. That's the only way I'm going to feed her is through the wobbler, which is just, like, she wobbles the kibble out. And that gives me, like, an hour. She will do that for an hour. hour. It takes her an hour. So it's just, like, an hour Mm -hmm. of peace, but because she's so wild mm-hmm. in the house. But if I had taught her bed stay, and which we're working on, mm-hmm. um, do would I have to keep feeding her in a wobbler to engage her brain like that? Well, let me ask you this. So 
when you say she's wild in the house, mm-hmm. what do you mean by that? Just what are you trying to stop with it? Constant, like, never sitting down, mm-hmm. never able to relax, constantly sniffing, looking for something to get into, um, getting into anything that she can. She'll take rocks from my fireplace. <laughs> like, I have, like, little coals in my fireplace. And she'll just, like, I can see she has something in her mouth, and she just carries them around and has a pile of rocks. And her first two weeks with me, I like had my dining room table full of things I had taken away from her. Mm-hmm. She's constantly getting things and take getting things, and that was probably my bad for not managing her as well. Um, so we do use utilize the crate a lot when I can't keep an eagle eye on her, mm-hmm. but she needs that eagle eye when she's out of her crate as mm-hmm. she's as she's in the process of training. You look like you, you have stuff to say. I do, but I thought you were finishing well, up. No, it's just like a little follow-up question so I can put some notes down. Uh, I think enrichment is like fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I think I love that like people are doing that. But I don't. I think that people use it to, um, like you said, like band-aid issues that are there. Like avoid issues by having their dog focus on something else mm-hmm. rather than addressing the problem itself. Yeah. Like yeah. Sunday can't hold a bed stay, so I give her treats so she can leave me alone for an hour. But even bigger, like she's in your house getting into stuff, mm-hmm. you know. If that were something at the point in, in her training, if you stopped that, then you wouldn't need to. Mm-hmm. If you stopped her from taking things, you wouldn't need to distract her. Mm-hmm. But I think exactly. it'd still be good to... Hey, you can't take things, but mm-hmm. I'll let you like play with this Kong wobbler and yeah. eat out of it, you know, but first stop being like that. Like grabbing things that don't belong to yeah. her. Um, yeah. 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 But until, like you said, until you get to that point with your dog in the training process, mm-hmm. managing them so they don't like you mm-hmm. are, you know, yeah. and then teaching them to not take those things. Yeah. Like. With my foster dogs, I don't utilize e-collar or I try not to at all, um, especially if I'm working with a shelter that does not have the same views because they don't want you to use mm-hmm. those tools. So I have to manage without tools for quite a bit of time. Mm-hmm. So it's I use a lot of enrichment, um, a lot of crate time, and mm-hmm. crate and rotate the dogs, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of like physical activity and walks to yeah. kind of manage bad behaviors because I can't. I don't want to correct for them on e-collar. Yeah. I would say. I feel like that's probably all you really can do with those types of dogs anyways. Mm-hmm. If you can't really yeah. train them, mm-hmm. you're just managing. I, I think that kind of exposes the problem though, yeah. right? Like, I mean, the viewpoints that a lot of people have on utilizing training tools and stuff. And listen, like I'm not like you have to use an e-collar for this because like I'm sure there's plenty of other ways we could strategically go in mm-hmm. and correct for these behaviors without using an e-collar, right? But... I mean, everything you described, right? Picking up rocks, uh, excessively pacing around, looking Mm -hmm. for trouble. You said you had a whole table full of things she picked up, which I'm Mm -hmm. assuming you caught her with those things to take Mm -hmm. them, right? That's a lot of opportunities to tell the dog, you shouldn't do this, Mm -hmm. Yeah. right? Yeah. And I mean, we know this, right? Like once you stop that behavior and you tell the dog you can't do that, they Mm -hmm. stop doing that Mm -hmm. and then your problem is pretty much gone, Mm -hmm. right? As opposed to, months and months and months and months Mm -hmm. or years of management and needing to utilize all of these enrichment things and stuff, which again, I'm for enrichment. We Mm -hmm. talked about this, but it's not, it doesn't stop the problem, right? You giving her the Kong wobbler Mm -hmm. will give you an hour of, I don't need to supervise you because you're preoccupied with something, Mm -hmm. but it does absolutely nothing to tell the dog to Mm -hmm. stop doing this, Mm -hmm. you know? I also feel like if you stop her from doing those things, she'd probably just chill out on her own. 100 percent so yeah. much more anyways yeah i mean a bed stay is fantastic yeah. in creating mm-hmm. that but i'm sure you she don't would even just necessarily stop. need that though, yeah you yeah. know yeah i think it'd be like an added bonus yeah so so i don't know i mean like it like that one you, just logically it's like well you know i mean it's what we do mm-hmm. with dogs that come into our facility right you stop the problematic behavior so you don't need to micromanage them and you mm-hmm. don't need to have that hawk eye on them at all times mm-hmm. right yeah. Um, and it's a tough situation when you're in a, a situation of a foster, but like, that's the, that's the whole reason why, like, we don't work with certain shelters mm-hmm. and we don't work with certain rescue exactly. organizations and stuff like that is because they believe that. Mm-hmm. And we know that that I, I know or believe that that is doing more harm than good to these dogs mm-hmm. because that dog's going to get into a home yeah. and it's going to be with people that 
are not going to have the time or the patience sure. to be able to follow her around the house all day long to stop her from getting into everything. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to be like, we can't handle this dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're going to get rid of the dog. Yeah. yeah. Right. I love enrich, right? Like, listen, dogs need mental stimulation, yeah. right? And enrichment is a great supplement for it. Yeah. But a lack of enrichment is not an excuse for poor behavior Yeah, Mm -hmm. is the way I look at it, right? Like if there's a week that I'm working a lot of hours and the dogs sit at home most of the day and don't do a whole lot, that's not an excuse for them to start destroying my house. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Uh, I'm empathetic to they need that stimulation and I'll provide it for them. And I think that they'll probably be a little bit more manageable if they have it, but I still need to teach the boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a lot of people like you were doing with her use enrichment too. Uh, give yourself like some time like i Mm -hmm. had a lot of clients who will do that too or they'll use like those like lick mats with the peanut butter so they can groom their dog or Mm -hmm. do something versus working your dog through any like handling issues first Mm -hmm. and then giving them something to use for enrichment yeah as like a distraction um, from yeah yeah rather than it enriching them just to be a positive thing in their life yeah Yeah. a reward i think enrichment Mm-hmm. is kind of like a reward mm-hmm. almost like especially if you're using food um so now i have sunday on an e-collar because i own her um and i'm just starting to correct for anything that's you take in your mouth it's not yours you're getting corrected mm-hmm. if you're jumping on my windows you're getting corrected um but i'm taking the obedience things very slowly yeah 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 More of the behavioral stuff. i mean um bender's like really good he's just mm-hmm. he's chill all the time i don't have to like like when I'm editing, you know, I'll, I'll sit there for a couple hours and usually about like halfway through, you know, if he's just been laying there being fine, um, then I'll get like the Orby ball mm-hmm. or whatever and put like treats in there mm-hmm. and kind of give him like a reward for like, you know, I know this is boring for you and, but you've just been yeah. chilling, you know? So yeah. I'll give that to him. So he has something to do for that like last hour yeah. or whatever, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, <clears throat> but you know, it's just kind of like a reward for like, Hey, you're fine anyway yeah. like here's something for you to do yeah. for sure yeah so they're not bored at that point mm-hmm. right because like yeah. i do feel bad sometimes if i'm home doing housework all mm-hmm. day and the dogs are just kind of sitting around like yeah, yeah. can we go yeah. do something yeah. right? <laughs> they're not being poorly behaved or anything but like it would be nice to give yeah. them something to occupy mm-hmm. themselves with and i think that's where stuff like that should be implemented yeah mm-hmm. like you when know? i feel bad for not exercising doof i just give them a raw bone to yeah. go do something yeah. <laughs> i do things like that as well yeah like i'll yeah. utilize soup bones or treats um if it's a rainy, cold day yeah. and I don't want to walk. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. What's your name? That's a good one, though. I think, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, listen, like, I, and I'm not trying to poke at the rescue community by any means, right? Because there's a lot of rescues that we really, really love and yeah. work mm-hmm. with, right? But I really think that exposes a huge, huge problem in it. Yeah. Is not understanding that this stuff is simpler than we think, mm-hmm. you know? And if mm-hmm. we just go about doing some of those things, those are the kind of things that long term will stick with the dog, mm-hmm. you know? Look at jumping, right? Like once you stop jumping with a dog, you pretty much can take it wherever and they don't jump anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. an emotionally charged behavior that needs constant management. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a little nuisance habit that they have that you could jump in, you could stop it and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Krista, I just want to point out something really funny. I'm not going to use a name right now, <laughs> but I just got a message from somebody that had interviewed for a position with us saying, they sent in a resume and got an email back for an interview, but unfortunately, whoever emailed me was very unprofessional and stopped emailing back after giving me a day and time for interview. Just wanted to bring it to your attention since you own the business. <laughs> I know who it is. <laughs> and then there were screenshots of the, the message conversation, and you guys literally confirmed a day and time. Yes, and they said <laughs> I didn't confirm, and they no-showed their interview yesterday. Yeah. I just thought that was funny. <laughs> People. I that just said hilarious. it looks like you guys had confirmed a day and time. It didn't need any additional communication. Yeah, yeah like, did I, do I need to uh, hire you. her now? Should I hire? I don't know. Whatever. I just thought that was funny. I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good sign. Yeah, that is so funny. We're like there was a back. Right you foot. confirmed a day and like, and, hey, yeah. can you do this day? No, sorry, I can't do that day. I could do this day though. Great, let's do this day at this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then didn't show I'll up. Be there. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, okay. What's the next one? <laughs> I love that <laughs> I'm getting like tattled on. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's fun. Yeah. So fun. <laughs> <laughs> These um, are the things we deal with. <laughs> yeah. What else you got, Bridget? Okay. So that was a really good one. I like speaking that. Speaking on, like, going, speaking on enrichment, I'm reading a lot about like enrichment and like 
not having your dog have to be constantly stimulated. So uh, one of these trainers was saying that if you bring your dog to date doggy daycare every week for eight hours a day, you're creating a dog that constantly needs to be stimulated and can't settle down because they're around other dogs. So this trainer in particular did not recommend doggy daycare um, every day of the week. You know, they said maybe once, once or twice a week you should get your dog into daycare, but that constant simulation is going to create a dog that cannot settle down in your home. Um, Hell but, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Completely agree. We see this with, uh, what were you going to say? Go ahead. I was going to say with Doof. Mm-hmm. When sure. I first yeah, started yeah, yeah. there, Doof was in daycare all yep. the time. And then I started realizing, like, I think I created, like, a negative, not a negative, but a super aroused association with the mm-hmm. facility, mm-hmm. you know, as yeah. we all see with them. Yeah. I but. mean, this is the same as people that have dog walkers that come to the house every single day. They go and drop the dog off at their parents' house. If mm-hmm. they have to go to work, they bring mm-hmm. the dog to daycare. Like there are plenty of people that they create these dogs that are just never not with people. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it is such an important skill for your dog to learn how to just be by themselves and do nothing. Mm-hmm. It's essential. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I remember um, when I went to uh, I I spoke at Tammy McLeod's seminar in Nashville. Right. And she was working with this one dog who uh, and Tammy's a very heavily positive training trainer. Right. Mm -hmm. She uses e-collars and prong collars and stuff like that. But it's very, very positive. Right. Which is fine. She's she's a very talented. Does she have Learberg videos? She has a Learberg course on like building drive. Yeah. She has border collies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I watched some of her videos. She's very, very nice. Um, Whatever. So um, she was working with this one dog. And the owner was sitting there in every four seconds, either asking the dog to do something or giving the dog a reward for something, Mm -hmm. right? Constant engagement, constant Mm -hmm. engagement, constant engagement. And she could not get the dog to settle into any of the positions because the dog was always looking for the next thing, looking for the next thing, Mm -hmm. looking for the next thing, right? So they literally spent time just like, okay, cool. And and again, I wouldn't have done it exactly this way, but spacing out those rewards, Mm -hmm. right? Making sure that there was far more distance in between the interactions that she was giving and stuff and teaching the dog to be more independent in, it th- in its thoughts and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And that can be done with anything. That can be done through your training, right, of you're giving way too much engagement and constant kind of mm-hmm. information and stuff like that. That could be done in your day-to-day life where you're constantly talking to your dog or petting your dog. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the people we see come in for assessments and they're sitting there petting mm-hmm. the dog the whole conversation mm-hmm. for a whole hour. Mm-hmm. right and then it's like okay stop petting your dog for a second they stop petting the dog dog starts freaking out mm-hmm. right because yeah. the dog is reliant on the stimulation all the time or mm-hmm. that client that we had to that uh her shepherd was just amped all the time and anytime it one did a negative behavior she would redirect to playing tug yeah. or something oh, to yeah, distract yeah. You see that the dog yeah. yeah um and then to the enrichment things right this happens when you start using enrichment to stop problematic mm-hmm. behaviors right because yes it's a band-aid at that point mm-hmm. yeah i could give a dog enrichment things for eight hours a day and for those eight hours a day the dog won't do anything bad but what happens if the dog doesn't have those things mm-hmm. in well, the case of work. your sunday yeah. right like she goes around and she picks things up and does yeah. this and finds other ways to occupy themselves so um yeah i 100 percent agree with this um you know and and same deal you know not only from the constant engagement standpoint but the daycare thing i mean you know you do daycare every day those dogs are going to start getting crotchety and stuff Mm -hmm. as well like when you have your off day and you're just like hey i want to chill today and your dog is just like what are we doing today and running around and you're like oh no Mm -hmm. oh in upstate new york quick story really quick uh we had a daycare dog that would come every single day she Mm -hmm. was the most high energy dog Mm -hmm. and her owners were like uh marathon runners they would run her like 10 to 16 miles a day Mm -hmm. that dog had so much stamina that it was so annoying to have her Mm -hmm. in daycare because she nonstop. yeah because you're creating that stamina and building that yeah drive to do things all the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dogs are like creatures of routine (laughs) i feel like just get an obese dog that doesn't want to do anything like star before um (laughs) his weight loss journey. <laughs> he did not want to do anything. Mm. Or and me before my things. weight loss journey. <laughs> yeah. No. It's kind of, Bender is kind of like the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, when she was still working at Heights, um, she would take it, if she took him more than two days, like consistently, he would just like sit in the corner and be like, I don't want to fucking be here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He would sit by the door, like the gate and just be like, it was too overwhelming. Go. Yeah. Like he would, he'd be cool with it. And like, 
he he loves other dogs. He's great with other dogs, but you could just tell like his social he's the social limit was reached and he was just like, <laughs> yeah. I do not want to be, I just want to go home and chill. Like, his yeah. battery gets you know? tapped out. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah. That, yeah, it goes both ways. Either you get one that gets at this high rate yeah. and then mm-hmm. that's all they can do. And then there's the other ones that don't, you don't need this. I yeah. don't need this. I don't want to mm-hmm. be here. Like, yeah. I just want to go home and just relax. That's mm-hmm. why I also like, mm-hmm. like back to the point of like socialization being in shorter periods too of like super successful yep. but they don't need to be mm-hmm. every day for 10 hours a day yeah you exactly. know yep i would yeah i think exhausted. you could definitely create a monster with that for sure though yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. you know yeah. those two are very <clears throat> similar and that's why again enrichment as a supplement not as a solution mm-hmm. yeah. you know a supp- yeah that's, that's a, a really good, good way, way to put it, looking it. At it. Mm-hmm. how would you be if you had to just chill with a bunch of people oh my for 10 God. hours a day, five Try days Try 10 minutes. I'd, yeah. I'd be out. <laughs> you would yeah. be gone. Your social battery. Yeah, yeah the batteries out. would be I'm going to go nap after this podcast. <laughs> you know what's funny is I notoriously am the person that if I go hang out with friends, like I hit the wall, right? Mm-hmm. Where I literally run straight into it. And then mm-hmm. as soon as I hit that wall, I go find the nearest couch and fall asleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's literally what I do. It's you it. mean it's like it. I fell asleep yeah. at our bonfire? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you kind of have a pattern of falling asleep <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At When I'm done, I just take a nap and, and then everybody leaves my house. That's, and every Yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're at my house, you take naps. And yeah. Kristen and I are just like, all right, she'll yeah. be out for 10 minutes. She'll be back soon. I do. I yeah. do. Kristen needs to recharge. <laughs> I do that here as well where like if people are over the house, like once I'm done. I'm like, Psh, I'm going to bed. You guys can find yeah, your way out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. What's the next one? Um, just to keep things on the kind of the same, like concise topic, exercise. What role does exercise or training play in a hyperactive dog? Like I'm seeing a lot of people say a great way to stimulate your dog without treats is trick training, teaching mm-hmm. your dog's tricks without, you know, having, like you don't correct them. Um, so clicker training, trick training, like stupid things you can do. Um, uh, that collie mom, mm-hmm. do you watch her videos? So, yeah, so I really like watching yeah. her, like the dogs jump over her yeah. and like jump on her feet. And it's like, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. Your dog is the only sport could probably do that, but yeah. that'd be cute. Yeah. That'd be really fun. Would you consider trick training to be somewhat of enrichment or not yes. necessarily? What, yeah. So we had this conversation at the facility that one time. What is enrichment? Just mental stimulation, Bingo. right? Positive mental stimulation, That's which all would it be is, right, yeah. and it could be done through anything, mm-hmm. you know. Like you could, but again, keep in mind, and this is what I tell everybody: is like, as opposed to spending the time doing all those things, train your dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, training is mental stimulation, mm-hmm. right? You don't need to do all these other things. The difference is, I think one is active uh, mental stimulation, one is passive mental stimulation from the owner standpoint, Mm -hmm. right? One requires work from you. One does not require Mm -hmm. work from you. Mm -hmm. And we live in a society where we are looking to remove responsibilities from ourselves, (laughs) which is why I think these lick mats and all these types of things become so popular. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's great, but you, I still think like you should have that solid training first. Cause again, enrichment isn't a solution. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't Mm -hmm. be a solution. Yeah, again, uh, just reiterating and beating the dead horse here. Like, you know, I recommend to clients all the time in wintertime, go buy the 100 Tricks to Train Your Dog book yeah. and burn through it. You know, mm-hmm. teach as many as you want to as a way to give a mental stimulation if your dog seems like they're getting cooped up. But don't use it to stop the problems, mm-hmm. right? Like I said, like if I work a long week and my dogs do nothing they're still expected to behave themselves and go to bed when we need to go to bed and not tear up shit in my house and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but i will try to give them an outlet so that they're less cooped up Mm -hmm. yeah 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 pretty straightforward yeah the um rescue that i'm with right now the vice president has two little malinois not little they're pretty big and she does a lot of disc work with them like sure. the, the sport and that looks like really fun and cool yeah like the disc golf yeah. and or whatever it is but she's disc like dogs. Yeah. yeah she looks like badass doing this with her dog yeah. Oh, yeah her dogs are so cute and like <laughs> well behaved and well I th- you know i think uh you know Vinny's a good example of it. I talk about all the time. Like, I don't do that much with him anymore. Mm-hmm. And he's he's really good in the house at this point, right? Like, he does not give me a hard time with anything and stuff. But, like, I'm sure he was more fulfilled when he was doing all of those other mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah, I mean, I I think those things are great. You know, I think yeah. disc talks, you know, and especially finding an outlet 
from a like sport standpoint or something like that with your dog, I think has its benefits, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think you build a stronger relationship with your dog. You're providing more mental stimulation. Mm -hmm. You're doing something together with them. I think it's really good. I do think though, to the point of creating condition associations, when I was doing uh, bite sport and stuff with Vinny, I think he was worse than he is right now from the standpoint of, I think I created a lot of neurotic tendencies with him. And that's the thing you got to be careful with when you get into things like uh, toys and balls and frisbees and biting and like Mm -hmm. all those types of things is you can quickly create these just adrenalized responses, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did that with Doof with daycare and stuff mm-hmm. too. Cause now if like dogs are playing downstairs, you hear, hear him in the crate whining a lot mm-hmm. more. Whereas mm-hmm. if there's no dogs, he's way less yeah. whiny mm-hmm. too. It's but, a balance. Just yeah. like the daycare thing that person said, mm-hmm. if you supplement it in and make sure that you're balancing out not only the active time, mm-hmm. but the passive time of doing nothing, I think any of that stuff is really good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that disc dog stuff is pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, Alicia? Yeah. She, doesn't she do that with uh, her dog Gunner? Yeah. Or yeah. Which, which one is it? Chena? Chini? Chino? Chini. Chini. Oh. I think they do both. Yeah. yeah. She used to post some awesome videos yeah. of her doing yeah. that stuff. It always really looked really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She does the dock diving too, I think. She does. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, my, I remember when I was at Mike Allis's school, he talked about like dock diving with his uh, one of his Malinois and it would like lose it every time it would go up to the pool yeah, and he yeah. had to like work through that or too. Those, yeah. yeah, police dogs where they're like, they have to physically hold the dog back and it's like screaming because it yeah. wants to go work. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very common to see like those police dogs like just freaking out. Yeah. yeah. They well, that's go chase someone. The same as on the bites. When we do Mondia mm-hmm. Ring, we put that dog in the down when they're ready to, to like send the dog on the bite, they're losing their mark. Mm -hmm. right and with the police dogs honestly a lot of times they do that on purpose where they physically hold the dog back because that's how you create the frustration Mm -hmm. that causes them to go more intensely um yeah yeah i used to do like rainy used to compete in hunting competitions Mm -hmm. no no i know you look at her now and you're like what (laughs) (laughs) but she did a lot of like scent work and training and bird hunting yeah and going in the fields and doing a lot of that i think like that's like for doof because he gets so aroused so easily Mm -hmm. like if i were to do a sport i feel like he would be like that like Vinny with mondio like Mm -hmm. loses it and i feel like if you're gonna do a sport with a dog that's easily prone to getting really aroused you would have to understand probably to some extent that your dog is going to mm-hmm. build a uh, really neurotic association with that, mm-hmm. right? I would like, agree. Like yeah. fetching or like recall. Like, um, yeah. Like there was an episode of Caesar Milan where it was a German short hair pointer and they did a lot of hunting with it and stuff and it was retrieving. So then it would retrieve this like tiny little pebble, like the Mm -hmm. tiniest little pebble. And it'd like stare at the pebble (laughs) and stare at the person. And she's like, has like four kids. She's trying to manage her kids. And this dog keeps bringing this tiny little pebble to her. And Caesar Milan just like Caesared his way in there. And Caesared his way in there. By the end of the episode, the dog wasn't bringing pebbles anymore. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I think it's such a balance because it's like, okay, cool. Like you get some of these dogs that are genetically wired to do these things. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, They're going to find a way to occupy themselves somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So what it's really like, what is the balance of how much of that kind of stuff do you do with the dog versus Mm -hmm. try to fight that natural instinct, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think either way you create some problems, right? If you're you're fighting the instinct, I think you could find a balance, right? And I think that, you know, in Vinny's case, right, I don't really let him do a lot of those things anymore. And I haven't seen huge fallout from it. I definitely know there's times when he is not quite as fulfilled as he could be, Mm -hmm. right? But if you do too much of that kind of stuff and you really channel that, you create a ton of problems in itself as well, I think. I think it's kind of pushing your dog towards what you what fits into your lifestyle. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want Doof to be neurotic. And being aware of the dog that you're getting yeah. <laughs> as far as like are yeah. these types of things things that you want to have to do all the time yeah, with them yeah. for right? sure because you get into like it's not fair for you to own a dog like that and completely restrict them of yeah. everything mm-hmm. yeah you yeah. know yeah it's like people getting working german shepherds or, or yeah. malinois, malinois without yeah. really understanding <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really yeah. wanted one a couple months ago, and I was like, a couple months ago, me not right now. <laughs> you wanted a Malinois? <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. You should borrow price. Vinny for like. Did you? A week. Was was it Vinny that made you want one? <laughs> yeah, it was Vinny and this girl that I like uh, follow, and they're just like look so cool. And they are cute. I that little Malinois them. puppy I had mm-hmm. yesterday. Oh, she Real was cute. She was really good looking. So eventually, in my life, I will have a Malinois when mm-hmm. all the Chihuahuas <laughs> have <leave>. fun. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Good luck. All right. On to the next. Uh, okay. Need a battery break. Oh, oh, quick battery break. Hold on. All right, we're recording again. All right. Bridget, next where, question. Where did we leave off? Okay. Um, we're talking about exercise. Okay, so another topic um, is counter conditioning. Mm. Responses to things. Um, really cool trainer on TikTok. His dog training business is called Say It Once Dog Training. Yep. Um, I really like watching his videos. I was watching a particular one um, where a dog would freak out if the owner's cell phone went off. Just even like a ding, like absolutely I've seen freak that out. Before. Yeah, and so he was counter conditioning. What? <laughs> <laughs> he was counter conditioning the response to the cell phone by using treats in a basket full of tennis balls. So he didn't appear to be correcting the dog at all, and he's a balance trainer. Sure. Um, and I just saw the process of like the dog is rooting through these, this basket of tennis balls and the cell phone's going off and off and off and off. And every time the dog looks at the cell phone, he throws a treat in the basket of balls Mm -hmm. and he's just trying to condition a different response from that dog. Mm -hmm. So I found that pretty interesting, but how would you go about that? Like if a client came to you and their dog freaked out every time a cell phone went off, what was the freaking out? Do you know? Biting, barking, lunging, jumping, trying to get the cell phone. Uh, it was a big bulldog, so um, pretty serious stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and this guy just seemed to like so seamlessly fix it. Mm-hmm. But go ahead. Is that not the same as a doorbell and mm-hmm. a dog freaking out sure. at a doorbell? It's a conditioned right. response to mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Right. So what do Which we could do be for whatever. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what exactly the reinforcement is behind <clears throat> mm-hmm. why the dog does it with a cell phone, but yeah. Do well, you guys hear that? Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry oh. about it. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you have more to say about it? Oh well, I, I guess <laughs> we're gonna call this the awkward podcast. <laughs> yeah. Awkward silence. I, Lots sorry. of awkward silences <laughs> spilled throughout. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were continuing with something. No, no, no. Take, take um, the reins. <laughs> I honestly, I guess I don't really know that much about counter conditioning because I don't, I, I don't think that we use it that. What is counter conditioning? Hey, it went away. <clears throat> the hum. Yeah. Um, what is it? Uh, whatever the dog's response is, flipping it, basically doing a 180 response. Mm. <laughs> creating a new conditioned association with a behavior that had a negative conditioned association. Yeah. Right. So, so does it work? Sure. Right. Like, like you said, I mean, it obviously Mm -hmm. worked in this case, you know, I've seen before in the past people condition the doorbell to mean to get onto the bed, right? Uh You condition in that, that cue that typically Mm -hmm. had a certain meaning now has the meaning of getting onto the bed for something positive. How is that not, classical conditioning it is classical conditioning you uh, use classical conditioning to counter condition oh, something okay. right classical don't, conditioning don't is just me. the <laughs> process of conditioning something right <laughs> counter conditioning is your reconditioning something mm-hmm. with counter conditioning yeah. that had a different <clears throat> association right yeah. so you're taking it this this stimuli means this and you're changing it to this stimuli means this mm-hmm. yeah right so it's it's you're correct right Here's my issue with a lot of it, right? Not that it doesn't work, but, right? Let's let's start looking at some of the common things that people would counter condition, right? Um, touching paws, putting collars on, petting, doorbells, reactivity. things like that, reactivity, right? All of these different things, right? It's the idea, my problem with it is the idea that you're going to make everything have a positive association Mm -hmm. and that that is not real life, Mm -hmm. right? And it is not sustainable because of outside competing reinforcement, 
right? Mm -hmm. I think that most of these things, doorbell for example, right? I think the actual reinforcement of somebody being at the front door is a stronger reinforcement than the association you're going to create of the dog getting onto the bed when they Mm -hmm. hear it. Right. And I think that just like you counter condition it one way, I think it will quickly counter it condition itself back to the original in time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Touching paws. Right. Obviously, because the dog already has a negative association with touching the paws, I think in time, that negative association of the times that it scares the dog is going to be more powerful than the positive association you're going to create with touching Mm -hmm. the paws. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So I think where I prefer to use it is I prefer to stop whatever the response is first. That way I eliminate that reinforcement so it doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. Then I will counter condition the association to something more positive after, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Let's use this example, right? If I stop that response of the dog freaking out and biting and jumping and I correct for it, and then I go through the process of creating a positive association with that tone, I think I'm going to have a much more balanced, longer lasting response out of the dog, right? Uh, I look at this very similar to fearful dogs, right? And people that calls and say, I have a dog that's scared of everything. He needs more confidence and stuff. And I always ask themselves, is the problem that your dog doesn't have confidence or is the problem the responses your dog has when they get scared, right? Because no Mm -hmm. matter what, there are going to be things in life that scare Mm -hmm. your dog. Mm -hmm. There are going to be things in life that your dog has a negative response to, right? That will not, I don't think that that will go away, Mm -hmm. right? And if you spend all your time counter conditioning those things, you don't teach the dog to adapt to the stress and adapt to the fear and to face that head on and be more confident and stable through that, Mm -hmm. right? So I think it has a time and a place where you you could spend time working through certain things and, you know, maybe... Let's say you do it the reverse order. Let's say, because I don't disagree with what the guy did, obviously. I just think that long term, it's probably not going to be the only solution for it. Let's say you spend the time counter conditioning like that. So you teach a positive association with it. You teach what's expected, right? Then when that behavior resurfaces later on, you punish it really firmly, Mm -hmm. right? I don't have a problem with that either. Mm -hmm. You know, I just prefer to do it the other way around because I think it's faster Mm -hmm. and I think it's a little bit more effective. I also think like a big... uh this probably isn't going to be worded that well, but a uh, big negative side to it is are a lot of owners going to do that with everything yeah. that their dog has a bad response to? No, because it's too time consuming. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's like the, the uh, basket of balls out. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably just a highlight reel of that dog's best. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You know? But sure. I'm sure that dog is exhibiting sure. that behavior, those negative behaviors elsewhere. Ah, I was just know? going to say that too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Is that the only place in this dog's life that it does shit like that? Probably not. Yeah. So now you have to counter condition everything Mm -hmm. that your dog has that response to. Yeah. And this is a hard one, right? Because like if we look at what's the proper way to do things, right? I talk about this a lot. If I were to, if I were to have everything perfect and train a dog exactly how I envision my head, the correct way to train a dog would Mm -hmm. be, right? I would spend the time building food drive and teaching everything Mm -hmm. with it, working around low distractions, creating really positive associations with things, layering in very light communication through the leash, layering Mm -hmm. in very light communication with the e-collar, starting to add in bigger consequences later. And I would take this long process with teaching all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Same with the counter conditioning process. I would try my hardest to create as much of a positive association with stuff as possible and reinforce the things that I liked so the dog knew what I expected out of them so that the consequences would be more clear to them and blah, 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 right? I just don't think that's real life with mm-hmm. our clients. Yeah. You know? Well, no, uh, a lot of the dogs that we get have already been practicing those negative behaviors or not being put in situations with like a positive association or whatever it is where I think if yeah. you start from ground zero, you're able to work through that. But there was a Michael Ellis said one time how he had like um, one of his uh, Malinois, like he tried to go as long as he could with only positive training and he said two years in never corrected the dog but then he had to and he started implementing but that dog stressed out so much more from a a correction uh because it had never had a consequence before Mm -hmm. you know so like that just a smaller correction created so much more stress for that dog yeah Gary Wilkes had a really interesting thing that he talked about in his seminar that I went to. 
uh, where he talked about intermittent stress is very, very healthy for all beings, right? Uh, for dogs, for people, for whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and the idea was if you teach the dog to to tolerate, that not tolerate, but if you teach them to work through that and rebound back from that more regularly, mm-hmm. it's not as dramatic when it actually happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that's a lot of it too. Like we, we, we spend all this time doing these things trying to avoid stress. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, when does that create a balanced dog? If yeah. my, I mean, if I have the most perfect life, right, and everything is easy and everything goes my way mm. and blah, 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 and then suddenly something really negative happens, that's going to be detrimental to somebody, mm. right? Yeah. Where if you get used to the ups and downs of life, mm. right, you kind of know how to dig yourself back out mm. of those holes a little bit more successfully, mm. right? And this is the way that I've always tried to look at this kind of stuff is, is, I, I think that the 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 way we do it, where we try to focus on both sides and we don't try to avoid one side more than the other, mm-hmm. I think creates a more balanced dog in the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. again, all of this is kind of hypothetical to an extent. Like there's no studies, I don't think, that say like this is right, this is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's got their own approach. It's just when you look at these things and you look at the way that we're doing it, you look at the way that they're doing it, I have a I have a really hard time seeing the long term success of some of those ways, and I feel like I could see more holes in them than mm-hmm. not. So yeah, yeah. Do you ever watch uh, Shit's Creek on Netflix? Never. I've never what? watched. It. I love Shit's <clears throat> Creek. Yeah. It's, yeah. I've it's heard literally. It's I've heard it's great. Yeah, they were like the super rich family, and then they mm. lost everything. Oh, yeah. So like the, mm. especially the kids, because yeah. like they have to <laughs> yeah. like live in a motel. Like that's where it like pretty much all takes place, mm-hmm. and they're just. I have no Actually, idea what's going on. Yeah, and um, the what's the daughter's name? <laughs> Alexis. Alexis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, her uh, saying is "Ew, David," and there's the, that's on a T-shirt, yeah. and it's a lot on a lot of stuff. Anyways, I'm you gonna get you guys all of. that shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought yeah. it'd be really funny. <laughs> but it, it was just a funny correlation. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it was. They were spoon fed their whole life, and yeah. they didn't know mm-hmm. how to like get a job or anything like that it, I, yeah. I i don't know i don't know that many people with children because they're monsters but um <laughs> oh my God. But, but i feel like people are so um sensitive <clears throat> about their dog going through stress mm-hmm. and it's not the same with their kids people mm-hmm. baby their their pets so much more mm-hmm. i don't know i i work with a lot of families with children that are very very micromanaging of their kids oh with really stuff like that yes, yeah, yeah to I don't avoid know. issues mm-hmm. and like holding their hand through things and stuff so you see it transfer to the dogs too yeah or, yeah oh uh, do you have no any- i'm just saying in general i think i think people do it both ways yeah. right do you do you find that uh any of your clients that have children are um harder not harder but have more strict rules with their children but not with their dogs depends on the, the honestly it's, it depends on the generation i feel like i work mm. with a lot of uh 55 year old moms and stuff Uh 60 year old moms and stuff who just like they grew up raising their kids with like you better listen you know (laughs) and they're very firm on their dogs as well and they don't really take shit from them yeah you know but some of the younger couples and stuff i feel like are a little opposite yeah Mm -hmm. younger couples with children i should say i could see that for sure cool next all right um i know we've talked about reactivity on leashes a ton um, but in the positive only world, like I was deleting bookmarks from my phone recently and there is this trainer called Patricia McConnell. Is that the one you sent me? Yes. I know Patricia. So I, when I was first starting out with Nelson, he was horribly reactive to the point I could not walk him and he would slip out of his harness because I, I was a harness mom and he would slip <laughs> out of his harness and go charging at like 60 pound pit bulls and stuff. And there was one time he like this, he charged at this pit bull and it literally like grabbed him by the neck, tossed him up in the air. And I had such a clear image of Nelson coming, flying through the air, coming down. Not funny, but I was terrified at the time and I could not get this dog, um, to get off the dog. So I just like grabbed the bear hug, this random dog and like got it off. So I was like, all right, I need to try something. So I was like trying to do her program, her approach to things and emergency U-turns, treats. Nelson didn't give a shit about treats when he was in a red zone moment, as I call it. Um, and I tried the mu- emergency U-turn. I tried everything and nothing worked. And Patricia McConnell says in that article, punishment is never a good idea. 
And then going on, she says, dogs need to be taught an appropriate behavior on cue before you can correct for it. So my question with reactivity is, I'm seeing that a lot, that that phrasing, like you're not teaching a dog not to be a reactive, you're just correcting it. And that's why all these reactivity, dogs with reactivity, they don't believe in correcting the dog for it. Okay, so the, the there is the one thing in the dog training world that pisses me off the most is when people say, that's not teaching, that's just correcting. Yeah. Right? Isn't that the same? Isn't correcting well, still Aren't they teaching? learning something yeah. from yeah. that? Yeah. <clears throat> Don't they learn? Yeah. Is lear- wow. If you learn something, wouldn't you have to have been taught that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that, like that, that alone just makes no sense to me, right? Mm-hmm. So, but ahead. pet owners aren't picking that apart. They're like, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're probably right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. And just like posts, I saw a post of a positive only dog trainer. It was like, reactivity will likely be something you struggle with your dog's whole life. I'm like, that's so sad yeah. to yeah. think that you're going to struggle with this dog. Like my mom's dog, Benny, like he's so horrible. She can't take him for walks, which is why he's morbidly obese. <laughs> and I walk that yes. dog around my neighborhood with just a <clears throat> slip lead. And I just mm-hmm. corrected him with a slip lead. And my mom walked him the other day. She said, his walk is 99% better. And she's never had a walk with him so successful. And yeah. I was like, yeah, mom. So this hard. is the thing, right? Like, like you look at how much marketing is in positive only training from mm-hmm. the standpoint of like, this is why you should do it this way. This is why this is bad. And honestly, you know, th- there's the old saying, like, you don't uh, build the biggest tower by tearing everybody else's down. Or you don't, mm-hmm. big the bi- you don't build the biggest building or, or skyscraper by tearing everybody else's down. Something like that. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same with positive only trainers. I feel a lot of them, right? The one thing I liked about that Sophia Yen was that she didn't totally discredit that po- that negative reinforcement and like positive punishment yeah. doesn't work. She mm-hmm. just argued that there's a better way to do it, which yeah. I can have respect for that. That's fine, mm-hmm. right? Um, when people say things like it should never be used, it doesn't work, it's not teaching, that's the tearing everybody else's building down to make yours the tallest. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that mentality. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like a toxic <clears throat> mentality. Yes. So so that alone tells you you're kind of full of shit to an extent. Because mm-hmm. I've said this over and over and over again. If positive <laughs> only train yeah, COVID over there? <laughs> if no, positive only not. training did you get your shot yet? Second one? Second one's Monday. Ugh, why are you here? Man. Yeah, get out of here. God. The only unvaccinated person here. Hey, mm-hmm. did <laughs> you yeah. see, wait? This is a big tangent. Did you see that money? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that okay, right now because well, I got some strong opinions on that. Sorry. Strong. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. I want some money. What a. T- yeah, that's... Oh, Jesus Christ. Are you getting paid to get a COVID shot? A $1 million well, or something? You're entered into a $1 million grand prize if you get your first shot. And uh, now this one I don't have a problem with. There's there, the, the other one is like they're going to pay somebody's college tuition and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to get into it. She's about, I'm going to get the shot now. <laughs> no, no. What a joke. Yeah. What a great use of taxpayer dollars. Yeah. Let's just pay somebody out Is a it? million dollars to what get. What the fuck? Where else are they going to get the money? Am I allowed to cuss? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. We're not, <laughs> let's go back to the question here. So, positive only training in this kind of sense, right? I, I lost it. You lost my, tra- lost my train of thought there. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so tearing everybody else down. It, oh, yeah, yeah. What I was saying. Here we go. So, so. If positive only training worked the Mm -hmm. way that everybody says it worked, they would monopolize the dog training game. Mm -hmm. Done, right? Like who doesn't want to give their dog treats all day? Mm -hmm. And if it stopped all of your fucking problems and stuff like that, people would do it all the time, Mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, it does not work that way. There's Mm -hmm. too many variables. Life is not as um, black and white and predictable as everybody thinks that it is. Mm-hmm. There are going to be outside things that happen yeah. that are out of your control. You're not living in a bubble. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work that way. Right. And then you go to this dog you were just talking <laughs> about and how you were able to stop it in a day of walking this mm-hmm. dog. Does, I yeah. mean, that tells you in itself as well, right? Mm-hmm. This does work yeah. actually. Right. Mm-hmm. You can say my dog's not, I'm not teaching anything, mm-hmm. but the dog clearly learned to not react. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And whether and they're just, scared or whether they don't want to get corrected or whatever it is, they have learned to inhibit that behavior. Yeah. And mm-hmm. well, with Benny, simple fix, you know, mm-hmm. nothing too outrageous. No, or, I didn't even use uh, like a tool besides a slip lead to yeah. correct him because I know long term my mom is never going to put an e collar on that dog. She's never going to keep up with prong walking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like some structure mm-hmm. already has helped, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I don't know. I mean, so so you can get into so like some of their ways of doing it, uh, like bat and cat training or whatever it is. I believe it's uh, behavioral adjustment training and mm-hmm. conditioned association training. I believe mm-hmm. I could be mistaken about that. Um, but bat and cat is like the positive only mm-hmm. way of doing it. And basically behavior. And again, I, I may be mixing these up here right now, but bat training, behavioral adjustment training is essentially teaching alternative behaviors. So essentially you get the dog to turn away from the trigger Mm -hmm. before they start responding to teach an alternative, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No different than dogs jumping, right? You start teaching the dog to sit instead. You're teaching an alternate non-compatible behavior, right? So you're adjusting their behavior through that, right? Cat training, uh, conditioned association uh, or adjustment training or, or whatever it may be, is essentially counter conditioning the response right so when the dog looks at the trigger we reward dog looks at the trigger we reward dog looks at the trigger we reward so we're creating a positive association with looking at the dog so those mm-hmm. are the two ways that they typically recommend doing it yeah. um you know we just talked about uh uh, uh, uh counter conditioning behaviors mm-hmm. i've with reactive dogs in the past before once i stopped the reactivity used food on the walk before mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with doing that. I think that could help give a little bit more clarity to a dog, but you still have to stop the behavior too. Yeah. Right. Cause the only way that that works and I use works loosely because, you know, I don't know how long lasting it is, is if you live in that bubble can always work at the proper threshold with your dog. Mm-hmm. Because the second you get past threshold, you've lost the fight. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, all these Instagram videos that I'm seeing of like these positive only owners, just owners, not even mm-hmm. trainers that have reactive dogs. Oftentimes, a lot of them are saying like, oh, six months and we finally have my dogs not like freaking out at the end of the leash. Mind you, they're still 20 feet away from the dog, not even being able to pass the dog. But are owners going to want to take six months of continuously working with their dog just so they don't freak out? Like that's not going to Mm -hmm. be consistent. It's not. Yeah. Long term. Yeah. I I don't know many owners that want to put in six months just Mm -hmm. for their dog to not freak out from 20 feet away. You know, like more power to you if you're going to put that much effort into your dog and if you feel like that training is working for you like I'm not going to demonize the way that you train your dog as long as you're not going to come after me for the way I train my dog yeah um it's just like there's so many people right now that are so unwilling to train their dogs they're so unwilling to correct their dogs and I feel like that's so sad I think you have to look at especially like with the clients that we work with and that we train pet dogs to Mm -hmm. what our owners going to keep up with because Mm -hmm. how can we get this dog successful and how are the owners going to be successful and keep up with the training Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. I always get the question oh when can I take the e-collar off like when they're so eager to and I'm like wait a second Mm -hmm. like just calm down Let's do this training. <laughs> Calm be down. Consistent. Calm down. <laughs> do the training. Be consistent with your corrections. Yeah. Set your boundaries in your house. Yeah. And yeah. we'll see where you are in six months. Yeah. We'll see where you are in a year. We'll see where you're in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, but even then, like your dogs, your dogs, my dogs, like they still have the e collars on. Mm-hmm. You know, we still use them. They're mm-hmm. going like my dog's gonna be on an e collar the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. You know, not because he needs it to be okay, but I'll we talked about this uh in the Sophia Yin thing where I'll agree with what the positive only trainers say of negative reinforcement or positive punishment is contingent on that reinforcement always being there. Mm -hmm. Right. But I will also say that's the same with the opposite, Mm -hmm. right? Positive only training Mm -hmm. will be contingent on the dog always having some degree of a reinforcement schedule Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, it's the same either way. Mm -hmm. I think an e-collar is easier to use though. And then if you could leverage both, it makes it even better. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But people are so eager to, not have an e-collar on sure. you know or why? to not you're always yeah. gonna put a leash on your dog when you walk mm-hmm. down a busy road yeah that's what i say mm-hmm. so why not put on a tool that you can communicate a little better with your dog than mm-hmm. just that leash mm-hmm. yeah mm. i agree you know um i think another big factor when it comes to reactivity and it comes to the success of the kind of counter conditioning route with it is how emotionally charged of a response the dog has you know mm-hmm. i think that there are some dogs out there that are just wild and reactive and bark and whatever but they're not doing it from this crazy emotional like 
fear or whatever mm-hmm. it may be, right? Yeah. They're just doing it from the standpoint of I'm just a wild, out of control dog. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the dog you probably, if it was very, very food motivated, can teach them to ignore the other dog and pay more attention to you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No different than, sure, if a dog is jumping on me, I can get them to do something mm-hmm. else yeah. temporarily, right? I could get them to focus in on me and sit down as opposed to jump, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's the more emotionally charged dogs that mm-hmm. um, are struggle more with that and that that's not going to be quite enough with it, Yeah, you know? They get too in their head about mm-hmm. it because reactivity is a spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. You have dogs that are not that reactive, just kind of butt heads, and then you have mm-hmm. these super, super hyper, hyper mm-hmm. reactive dogs, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I think that that's a big variable as well. It's not talked about very frequently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just can't imagine living with a reactive dog for the rest of my life. Like, I think we did two sessions with Nelson back when I first started. Mm-hmm. I don't use e-collar Nelson at all now. Um, he's in completely off e-collar, and we go on walks, and he doesn't react at all. Yeah. And they learn that they can't do that anymore. I mean, yeah. I, before mm-hmm. you guys got here, I walked the three dogs, and they didn't have their e-collars on or anything. We're walking yeah. down the street, coming back. Mm-hmm. I remember Kate telling me when she got Deli at first, Deli used to try to chase motorcycles and react at mm-hmm. cars and all that kind of stuff. She doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. She learned that that is not an appropriate mm-hmm. behavior. Yeah. And I don't need to carry around a pocket full of treats for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I'm not contingent on having the e-collar yeah. on all the time as well. Yeah. Like I can get doof to do things without yeah. an e-collar, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. also not as reliable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So creating reliability with your like recall is so important. Yeah. And mm-hmm. your, just your stationary positions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? So, yeah, for when your love is too, <clears throat> it is so much for your dog that it becomes self-centered, self-serving. So I'm not going to name the client's name, but they love this dog so much that when they came for the send home, like there was no stopping them from touching the dog. Everybody went around and held the dog and kissed the dog. And I was like multiple times, I was like, let's keep it in a training. You know, I kept saying it, kept saying it. They completely blew me off. And I was just like, how selfish this is right now to be loving on your dog and reinforcing all these nervous behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like, when is your love too much for your dog? Like affection, like playing, everyone wants to give their dogs affection, Mm -hmm. but like refusing to use an e-collar because you think it's abusive or loving your dog so much, you're constantly enriching it, constantly keeping it um, as mind stimulated because you think that this is what best makes you feel better. But people don't often step back and say, what does my dog need? Well, I think that's, that's where it's our job to tell them that. Mm-hmm. Good, that's exactly sorry. what I was going yeah. to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's that's our job to communicate mm-hmm. those things. And this is where you start getting into the tough conversations you have to have with owners and having the confidence to be able to deliver that message really effectively. You know, um, like those are the kind of owners mm-hmm. where it's like, OK, cool, like. Like we're going to, we're going to hit pause. Like we talk about that before mm-hmm. in send home sometimes and stuff. We got to hit pause and we need to have a real conversation about yeah. this right now. Like you guys need to stop doing this yeah. because of this. Yeah. Right. And you know, and, and this never happens, but mm-hmm. like if somebody just told me, no, I'm going to do it anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've like, never sorry, had it like happen. Most people, when you explain yeah. what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. You know, but I, sometimes you do have to be very blunt sure. about it. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, still working on that. It's it's mm-hmm. so hard to to look <laughs> internally at that kind of stuff. You mm-hmm. know, like unless you have somebody on the outside mm-hmm. communicating those things. I mean, mm-hmm. any any good self development that you do, like non dog related, dog related, whatever it is, mm-hmm. is typically triggered from an outside source. Whether mm-hmm. it's somebody telling you something, you know, you having a conversation about it, you reading about it somewhere that forces you to kind of look at it and question it. You know, well, any of those types of things. And social media and the culture now mm-hmm. is to give so much affection and so many, so much like, um, like things to your dog, you know, yeah. treats and toys and beds and like all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, to answer your question where it becomes selfish mm-hmm. is once it's been explained to you very clearly and you have consciously communicated that you understand that mm-hmm. and you choose to still do it then yeah, yeah. that's yeah. where it becomes selfish is once you understand how it is creating problems but you emotionally cannot stop doing it still mm-hmm. you know yeah. that's a you problem at that point yeah but until it's communicated clearly and yeah. effectively i can't 
put too much of the blame on them, right? Like that's yeah. like the, when we yeah. talk to new clients and I could listen to them and I could tell them literally you fucked all of this up, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but they didn't have the knowledge yeah. to not do that. So mm -hmm. even though, yeah, it's, it's your fault, yeah. but I don't hold that against you. I would say almost... 99%. I can't think of a client that I've explained it to and has chosen not to listen. Mm -hmm. Maybe in some situations where they're still practicing that impulse control themselves of not mm -hmm. having the habit of petting their dog. Mm -hmm. But I would say um, almost 100% like understand and they, they work through that mm -hmm. and try, try to stop for the better uh, of their dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah. I agree with that dog, completely. But, but I, I think that's the key with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like too much love creates a dog that's just like so unstable because it's so reliant yeah. on what you're going to do next, what move you're going to make. Yeah. And well, and if I have clients like that that are ignoring what I'm saying, then like David said, hit mm -hmm. pause, doing whatever I need to to explain what the dog's reaction is to all that affection that you're giving and why it's mm -hmm. bad, okay. you know? And then they start seeing like, oh, in this real situation – I'm giving so much affection to my dog and they're jumping on me. Mm -hmm. They're nipping my hands. They're whatever, or just in a neurotic mm -hmm. mindset. And when they start seeing that and realizing like their behavior is creating a negative behavior mm -hmm. in their dog, then they, I think they start piecing it together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like when you personally get frustrated with friends of yours, when you're like, please leave Doof alone. He's, mm -hmm. he is in a down state right now. He's working and they go up and purposely mess with him. Yeah. And that's like breaking Doof's stability. Yeah. That's, for me, that's really self-centered of them because they want to pet the dog so that yeah. they're not listening to yeah. you. Um, and that's when I try to, I know who you're talking about, but yeah. that's when I try to like explain to them, like, do you not see that my dog is freaking out mm -hmm. right now, holding a bed stay, but still freaking out and mm -hmm. you're causing that. And then if he breaks it, I need to step in and correct mm -hmm. him. Whereas, you know, if you can leave him alone, we can just not have a whiny dog. Yeah. Yeah. And it must be frustrating for you. Yeah. The emotional standpoint of like the relationship makes that hard as well. Yeah. You know, so like I, I have no clue what you're talking about, obviously, but, um, you know, there are certain people that if you have like a, a very close relationship with them, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very difficult to set boundaries. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because yeah. it's this, like we do, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we don't have those boundaries because we just hang out and do yeah. whatever together. We're yeah. always having yeah. fun mm -hmm. and this and that. But then you start understanding <clears throat> how important it is to set boundaries in your day to day yeah. life with friends, with yeah. colleagues, mm -hmm. with whatever, you know, and yeah. dog, you know, anything. Yeah. Like you would never in a million years allow somebody to come up to your dog in public. Yeah. It wouldn't happen. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, so we talked about it on the podcast the other day. I was at platform on Monday with Vinny and like, six people tried to just come up and pet him yeah mm -hmm. and same deal I was like no you need to like get the fuck out of yeah. here or you yeah. can't do that yeah. right i more so do it out of like my irritation of you not sure. even asking me to yeah. like i find that rude but that's and, like, the I same thing with somebody understand. coming to your house and just trying to pet him yeah mm -hmm. you yeah. know they're they're you, and especially if you're trying to communicate oh, yeah. a boundary and they're still doing it at that point i definitely communicate it's it's one of my neighbors who uh uh, is like in that like um, pet owner type of mm. mindset where every dog should just be like so loved and like given mm. so much affection or whatever. And like, I definitely like set those boundaries, but you mm -hmm. know, when he's drunk, he doesn't care. But <laughs> he keeps yeah. crossing that and yeah, yeah. it all affects <laughs> At that point now though, I remove Doof from the situation. Mm -hmm. sure. So now anytime I hang out with that, Doof's in the crate or mm -hmm. Doof's not at my house, mm -hmm. you know. Which is, I, I think is still setting a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Setting the boundary of, listen, like you're not able to behave yourself right now so you're not gonna have what what quadrant of learning is that <laughs> oh my god stop. what is it what is it <laughs> i can't under the pressure of this um you're removing something uh, from the equation negative, to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. No. Punishment. Sorry. Negative yes. punishment. Negative punishment. Negative can, punishment. Can, sorry. Can you She's erase this clip? removing doof from the equation. <laughs> no. <laughs> Who's editing this? <laughs> to decrease the likelihood yeah. of his behavior of not listening See, to I told you that when you test me in the moment, I can't think of what that it is. That was a good one, right? Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> Dang. But quadrants alert it's it's real life yeah. they but exist mm -hmm. i do what i have to do to make sure like doof's not going to be reinforced yeah. in that situation mm -hmm. you if if you can't control yourself doof's getting out of that situation yeah. sure. if, you if know? the thing you're trying isn't working yeah you have to look at what else you can try yeah yeah here's a here's an interesting one for you because <laughs> <It's> uh, <clears throat> 
our groundskeeper at our apartment complex. My groundskeeper. <laughs> yeah, whatever he is. It, it, it's, a, boy. it's a My it's a it's a sad like old guy that's not all there. So they kind of gave him a like here. here. You can live here and you can like mow nice. the grass and stuff. Mm-hmm. But he's not all there. I want he's, that job. He's 100% not all there. <clears throat> and he loves Bender. Loves, mm-hmm. loves Bender. Like, oh, thank you so much. He's the best dog in the world. Give him many puppy treats for me. Mm-hmm. That's my building and manager. He's like too. a really nice guy and he means well. But like he doesn't remember like yeah. like when we're when we are like out there training him or whatever. Like, And we try over and over. But he forgets. Mm-hmm. And then he'll try to give... Bender like human food mm-hmm. all the time, and that's when we're like, no, 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 and like, well, we have to like remove ourselves from mm-hmm. the situation as nicely as possible. But you know, it's not his fault. But it's like, sure, we have to step in and make that, yeah, that Try okay, we got to go. It's yeah. a variable at that point that's out of <clears throat> your control. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like we would love to control everything, obviously, but like I can't control if I walk into a place where there's dogs every two feet that those dogs aren't gonna physically yeah. get to my dog right <clears throat> so yeah, yeah you just avoid the situation then at that yeah point. yeah you just avoid it or like we were saying like you you physically have to just kind of step in and know sure it's time to get out of here or whatever yeah yeah big time what else okay <laughs> what a common thing that i've had people call in and ask like, like <clears throat> over the last year about five six times and then a lot of the internet is saying you are not a dog trainer unless you are certified in whatever that certification acronym is. That's ABC. Are you talking about ABC? E- Animal Behavior College? Uh, yeah, or? there's one and then there's C- like... Uh, CPT. And then like oh. the Certified Professional dash Trainer. CPET. Else. Certified yeah. Professional Dog Trainer. So there is people that have told me you are not a dog trainer because you are not certified. Is ABC do the CPDT? I don't know. Is that what? Oh, I'm not sure. Or is there multiple see, schools that qualify you for should, that? Because I don't I think you. that they're different acronyms. If I'm not mistaken, ABC is a college. Animal Behavior College. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Should tell so you how ridiculous this is. So do you graduate with a CPDT? <laughs> Let's find out. You guys discuss it. So this should tell you how ridiculous all this um, is because you're just saying a bunch of letters like yes. is ABT X Y F G. Well, we we're G-X-Y. probably not good dog yeah. trainers because none of none of us know. No, yeah, I know what they are. I just don't know what specifically yeah. they are certified. I don't know what ABC is certifying. And oh, what yeah, does yeah, that yeah, course look like to make you a certified well, dog trainer? I have very limited experience with any of this stuff except. At one of the facilities that I used to work at, uh, there was um, one of the uh, one of my coworkers was going to the uh, ABC and, you know, trying to become a dog trainer. And Mm -hmm. it had I just know that it had very limited actual handling hours that you needed to graduate. And Mm -hmm. most of it was book stuff. And I think that this is a very much uh, hands on skill that you need to learn. And you're not getting Mm -hmm. that from online training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, learning something online like there's a vet tech program that I was doing online back when I didn't know what I wanted to do yeah. and I applied for a vet tech position and they're like all right let's see what you got I had no idea what I was doing and they're like mm, you're yeah. not hired yeah yeah you need a lot of okay so ABC will certify the ABCPG which is the ABC certified pet groomer the ABC certified dog trainer so the ABCDT the ABCCT which is the ABC certified cat trainer <laughs> The oh. ABCVA, the ABC Certified Veterinarian Assistant, the ABCAMP, which is the ABC Certified Aquarium Maintenance Professional, oh. and the ABCZA, which is the ABC Certified Zookeeper Assistant Professional. Wow. They actually do more than I thought they did. Sounds um, like it's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Uh, so here's the thing, program. right? So, um, so who certifies the CBDT? Hang on. That's the question. Like, this is um, this is this is going to be my point in a minute, but I do want to look this up real quick. So this one girl that I, I do like on. Instagram. We should probably get demoted, huh? Well, you're not certified. <laughs> yeah, you're not certified. Because we're not certified. Don the Dawn to Dusk dog trainer. Wow, way to call out. No, I like her. I like, oh, oh. but I'm up <laughs> on her like bio. I can't think of her name on Instagram. No, it is, it is Dawn to Dusk. 
Here we go. I'm A B C D E F G certified. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so this is this is my point here. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this in a second. <clears throat> so so any certification that is out there only holds as much water as the place that you get the certification from's reputation, right? So for example, right, I could come up with the MK9 CPD or whatever, whatever, you know, like the Miracle K9 Certified Professional Dog Trainer course, mm-hmm. and I could offer that to whoever. There is nothing out there saying that I cannot do that. And then you could go out and tell everybody, look at this certificate that I got. Look at these Ackermans that I have in front of my name or behind my name yeah. or whatever it may be, because they're all privately ran, mm-hmm. right? So because of that, who says which one is the correct one? So I literally just pulled up two right now. So you got the ABC one. This one is from the CCPDT, which is the Certified Council for Professional Dog Trainers, mm-hmm. who has the CPDTKA, which is the Certified Professional Dog Trainer Knowledge Assessment or Assessed. Uh, it has the CPDTKSA, which is the Certified Professional Dog Trainer Knowledge and Skills Assessed. Uh Oh, my God. Well, it's just <laughs> just those two, right? Uh, let's see what else we got here. Let's see if I can find another one. Certified dog trainer. M- MK9. Yeah, should we start a dog training course? DT... C mm-hmm. P D P D yeah you can put that in <laughs> Krista Canines M K nine C C C P D Krista's Canines <laughs> certification <laughs> professional dog training make your own <laughs> certification <laughs> here we go here we go so this is interesting so the sprucepets dot com says the eight best online dog training certification programs of twenty twenty one. So, best overall, Karen Pryor's Academy. Mm -hmm. Best runner-up, International School for Certified Dog Trainers. Best budget, Penn Foster Dog Obedience Trainer Instructor Career Diploma. Diploma. (laughs) (laughs) Best variety, Animal Behavior College. Best for starting a business, Dr. Ian Dunbar's Serious Dog Trainer Academy. Best trial, Victoria Stillwell Academy. Best for working dogs, Top Tier Canine. Best certification, Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers. So there's all of these different ones you could choose from mm-hmm. that will give you some variation of the acronym of being a certified professional dog trainer. Who says which one's the right one? Yeah, They're not the same. It's mm-hmm. not like you're going... Let's look at college, right? It's not like you're going for, I'm getting my master's in business science mm-hmm. or whatever. And no matter what school you go to, it's the same degree. Yeah, You know what I mean? It's a different degree for each school. Yeah. Each one is teaching a different curriculum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's not a standard for it. So because there's not a standard for it, what's who the point? says, what's the point? Yeah. Who says mm-hmm. which one's correct? Yeah. yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. But people just want you to have a piece of paper. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To trust you. And yeah. Like experience means nothing. And Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I don't think experience is the end all be all. So, because there's dog trainers out there that have been training 35 years that are <laughs> trash. <laughs> you know, good, good point. Actually. There, I mean, there are. You know, yeah. And then, like, what's this trend with behaviorists? Because we had somebody call the other day, and mm-hmm. she was in tears, and she's like, "My behaviorist told me within 10 minutes of um, evaluating my dog, it needed to be euthanized. Mm-hmm. How could you come to that conclusion in 10 minutes?" Yeah, I actually don't know what is... A behaviorist. uh, Veterinarian behaviorist, yeah. But aren't they more... um, Don't they prescribe meds? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. But they don't train. But they also recommend training approaches as well. Like, so basically they say, you need to find a positive-only trainer and Mm -hmm. they'll help you with it. Because didn't Nike go to a behaviorist? A lot of dogs did, (laughs) Yeah, Glock. um, She was telling me Glock went to a behaviorist Mm -hmm. because he had severe dog aggression, which I had never seen... um, and they said they put him on trazodone. And then, then when he was on the trazodone, they tried to interact with this dog that he had issues with previously before the trazodone. And they said he was just like loopy and even more on edge because he felt loopy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're like, we tried the medication. It didn't work. We don't want to drug up our dog just to socialize him. If someone gave me an edible and then I had to go socialize with people, I would I'd lose be my mind. <laughs> 
Well, Bridget, though, like you're, you keep, you keep kind of answering your own question from the standpoint of like you just have to look at like your experience in mm-hmm. this and be like, okay, cool, Glock. We had out in daycare every single day. Mm-hmm. He was fine. With other <laughs> he was dogs. wonderful. Which yeah. means that this is not a medical issue, mm-hmm. right? This is a training issue, mm-hmm. right? And that that is the problem with all that kind of stuff, and that's the problem with going to these behaviors and stuff as a first resort yeah. is that they're going to try all of these medical related things for things that aren't medical problems. And we've talked enough about obviously the pet medication yeah. industry, but that's, I might be, BS. I, I feel like this is right though, but I feel people don't know where to turn. So they go to their vet mm-hmm. for things that aren't people trust their vet yep. as yeah. the person that's going to be able to give them solid sound advice on their dog. Mm-hmm. And then the vets probably are recommending these behaviorists, right? or recommending training because they're being put in this position of, oh my gosh, people are seeking out my expertise, so I need to have answers to it because they don't want to look like idiots, right? So then they make all these recommendations that they don't actually know what they're talking Mm -hmm. about because they're vets, they're not trainers. Yeah. And then they create more problems. And then, you know, there's the ego side of things, I think, of, you know, you're kind of in that mm-hmm. position. It's like you're kind of high and mighty yeah. in that pet world. So it's like what I say, well, this is definitely right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You start believing your own kind of shit, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, how many dogs have we gotten where someone the in, in the vet, like a vet or behaviorist have told them that their dog needed to be euthanized? Mm-hmm. And then we Numerous. get them and train them and then <laughs> they're not. Imagine hearing that being like, yeah, your dog needs to be euthanized. Yeah. And like, yeah. what? We had one dog that needed to be euthanized, was told it needed to be euthanized by a professional because you couldn't pick its eye crusties out, remember? Yeah, Romeo. Yeah. 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 And um, Ridiculous. Yeah. It's just yeah. insane. I mean, you see time, and this is why, you know, I guess like I can get a little jaded about stuff like this is because we mm-hmm. see it so much. Yeah. Right. I understand not all vets are like that. There are plenty mm-hmm. of vets we work with that are wonderful and they yeah. recommend out to really good trainers mm-hmm. and they kind of stay in their lane with things, you know? Um, but they're, I, I truly believe the vast majority of them are not really mm-hmm. like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the rescue world, you know, mm-hmm. rescue world is kind of similar. The rescue yeah. world yeah. is Very similar. the most toxic world you could ever imagine being in. Mm-hmm. For sure. I really want you to just take Spork to a behaviorist and just film it. <laughs> they'd be just... like, they'd <laughs> see <Euthanized>. him <laughs> guarding an empty bag of dog food and be like, done. <laughs> it's not safe. It's they nice. just you just walk him in there. You'd be like, uh, yeah, you need to. Just... Sorry, his face is just fucked up. When I, <laughs> when I give Spork bones, he will not eat them. He just sits there. Okay, and can I tell you guys? I I dog sat for Bridget like a couple months ago, and Spork woke me up at two in the morning because he was resource guarding his crate from nothing yeah. and i woke up to him just growling in his, in his cr- crate it's terrifying <laughs> because i'll be asleep on the couch he's like <laughs> <laughs> what i don't know why this is funny but little, little he resource guy sport but yeah. he'll never ever bite me he'll never resource guard from a human yeah. it's the yeah. other dogs in the house something's yeah. just wrong with him in the oh yeah there's a there's a couple screws loose yeah. if not all of the screws. if there's any screws in there no there's it, not it's, it's what makes spork spork mm-hmm. yeah isn't this stuff I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking about like just this, this, these like certifications and all these things we've talked it's, about so far. Isn't this stuff so wild though? Like when you really sit down and start like logically looking at it, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. and <laughs> being told that like invalidating my whole career because I'm not certified. Like yeah. Yeah. I have an education. I'm not going around. You yeah. should ask I have these a people. bachelor's degree. You know, what's funny is, is I, I used to do this shit all the time because I'm kind of an asshole like that. But, <laughs> um, I, I would ask him, I'd be like, okay, which certification would you like me to get? <laughs> which one? And then they'll be like, you know, the, the certified, the, the dog trainer certif- certification. I was like, yeah, but but which one? That's mm-hmm. actually a, that's actually really funny. Which one? If I ever get that question, that's, that's yeah, a good yeah, yeah. response. Because they don't know any of these. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's so many of them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Because yeah. each one of these ones, I just read these 13 or whatever. Each one of them has like five in it. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Which one would you true. like me to have? <laughs> like, what are you learning? Yeah. Yeah. You should get one from the ABC, like the like the zookeeper one or whatever, <laughs> and then just have that up there. And, they're, and they're like, are just you certified? Like, and be like, yeah, look, see. It's and for they would, aquarium animals only yeah, or something. But they would have no idea because they have no idea what they're talking about. They just want, like you said, they want to see a piece of paper. That's funny. You get the cat one. I'll get the aquarium <laughs> one. I want to get that. I kind of want to get the cat one. I want to go through you the cat train course. Turk, then. I already <laughs> trained that cat. Oh. Yeah. So an ex-pet sitter of mine started her own training company and I was like looking at it 
And it's just ridiculous, all the certifications she has. So Bridget putting everybody on blast. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I yeah, didn't dang. say her name, um, but she's like DTS, ABC, LGB uh, uh, certified. And I'm just like, what does any of that mean? Like, if I asked you, what would the, any of that mean? And I saw her walking, um, her dog, and it was like reacting to my dogs. And she's just like, no, click. And like reinforcing oh, the yeah. no click yeah. with a clicker because that obviously is the correct order of things. <laughs> yeah, I uh, love watching people at like the park with their reactive dogs with a clicker, and the, it's not or a squeaky toy you know? and like squeaking. Yeah, and be like, yeah. um, what was I gonna say? I was about to say something. I don't remember what it was. Oh yeah, I mean, it just goes to show also though. Like, I mean, like look at all these people out there that have like these degrees and different things that have mm-hmm. no clue what the fuck they're doing with it. Yeah. Not with it, but in that industry. Yeah. Like they're in that yeah. industry and they're clueless to it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It just goes to show how little that stuff actually holds water. To yeah. Anything. Yeah. So, all right, let's do like one or two more, Bridget. Okay. Um, genetics. Mm-hmm. I know we've spoken on genetics before, but I stirred up a big pot. Nice. In <laughs> a social media post I made and I was like attacked by multiple people and I kind of. Bridget and your social media. What social I media post? I didn't mean to. I was like. Where was this? Um, on my Snapchat or something. like a little snap doodle. Yeah, like months ago it was like Just a something. Just Snapchat argument. I don't what I said, but I was like um, a lot of the issues with your dog are being created by like your responses to things. And this girl put me on blast. She was like. So genetic or, or environmental? Like, um, or- like. Just like Sean O'Shea said, like one of his experts is like, your dog is doing this because you allow it, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 because you allow it. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of saying something like that. And she's like, no, dogs genetically can be messed up. And this whole like three page thing, she's like, I'm not trying to get in a fight with you right now, but you're But I'm trying to get in a fight with you right now. (laughs) And just like genetics play such a big part in dogs. Like They do, but here's the thing genetics do not say your dog has to do something right Mm -hmm. genetics say that your dog is more predisposed to doing something Mm -hmm. right they're more likely to try to rehearse a b c or d but it is still up to us to allow it or not allow it Mm -hmm. now there are certain things that from from a behavior standpoint Mm -hmm. right from a psychological standpoint i don't know if that's the right word for it or not but like your dog's fear or your dog's anxiety or whatever it may be or your dog's excitability or that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Those things are are those are genetic, right? Mm-hmm. Those things do not really change, right? But your dog's responses to those things can change, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, I think you guys are both right. I think is the problem and I think mm-hmm. that she's probably just getting on your case because she's trying to really sound right yeah well if you had a degree you could shove it in her face Mm -hmm. which one which (laughs) degree do i have to have good question but you're correct we're 90 percent of the things we are allowing or not allowing Mm -hmm. right genetics are not an excuse for a dog's poor response to certain things Mm -hmm. right Mm-hmm. but like a dog with a screw loose or something like that yeah but i think that's loose. way yeah. less than like what people think mm-hmm. I, the when only it dog comes to when it comes to behaviors that will not change yeah mm-hmm. right like aggression related issues <clears throat> is really the the best example i can think of of it dogs that are really inherently aggressive Mm -hmm. that genetic trait typically will not go away it's Mm -hmm. typically managed Mm -hmm. right but all of the other behavioral issues you're thinking of are typically speaking manageable or Mm -hmm. stoppable i should say uh side question kind of then would you say any dog that is actually truly unpredictable with aggression would have a screw loose, right? Yeah, I, I yeah. would say so. I don't mm-hmm. think that aggression is a normal trait. In Do you dogs. think? I don't it, think dogs should just randomly attack people or yeah, dogs and stuff. Yeah. You Do know? you think it goes the opposite way of a dog that has um, a screw loose is going to pretty much be unpredictable or not necessarily or no. untrainable? Right? Wouldn't it be no. the what? What other behaviors are you looking for if you're like that dog has a screw loose? Then, um. Just again, like I, I think you could have anxiety, you have fear, and you have aggression. Mm-hmm. I think those are kind of your big three genetic, or, or uh, well, I guess anxiety is kind of this as well, but neuroticness, yeah. right? I think those four are different types of genetic predispositions that your dog can have. But um, 
I, I'm going on a tangent in my head though. Anxiety again is like a huge spectrum. So at what sure. point of the spectrum is that sure. a screw is loose? Mm-hmm. When the dog still displays it after, it's a good question. When it becomes debilitating, yeah, right, and when normal, tried and true training methods do not help the dog to work through mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. right? I don't know. I and this is where you get into. I mean, this is the same conversation with people and or dogs. At what point is this? At what point is this a medical issue versus <clears throat> just you're a little quirky? Yeah. Right? Because yeah. everybody's a little quirky. Every dog is a little quirky, yeah. right? And every dog is going to display those things more or less intensely than others. So yeah. I, I guess I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what I would look for to say, like, something is truly loose. So, right? like, I, I can only think of two dogs in the entire time at this facility that I've ever thought, okay, something is truly wrong with that dog training can help manage those behaviors, sure. but it's still at the end of the day going to be unpredictable. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. 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 But, I, but both dogs, Hamilton and Leia, I, I think I would put Leia in that category. No. Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. And Hamilton, that's all that I can think of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very sporadic, like, like literally no predictable sign. Of yeah. It, mm-hmm. Right. No predictable trigger. For yeah. It. You know, like so, one day really good, next day really bad. Yeah. One day really good, next day really bad. Yeah. I would agree with that completely. The only the only uh, behavior, I guess, that they're doing with it, though, that I'm seeing is just aggression, though. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I think Leia is more, seems to be more it's, fearful. It's coming, yeah, but it's coming from a fearful or an anxious yeah. place, right? Mm-hmm. And they're learning that an aggressive response works. Yeah. But they default to an aggressive response with yeah. it, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I remember um, we had... Leia on social one time and Spork was like skipping up to her and like all happy and she was like wah, 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 and Spork just like simply turned his body and was like okay and, <laughs> and then Leia away. played with Aldous that one yeah. day yeah. Played yeah, it's like very those. very weird and yeah. unpredictable yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that dog I, um, I think I think in general I would look less at the spectrum of those behaviors or those behaviors in general now that I'm kind of thinking about it and I would look for like you were just describing, true unpredictability yeah. with stuff. Mm-hmm. With any of those behaviors, whenever it seemed truly unpredictable. Yeah. You know? Or whenever their behavior, their responses to it became truly yeah. unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you both saw Lindy, that, that little white pity mix that yeah. I had. Yes. And I'm confident that if I had kept that dog, I would have been able to manage sure. his behaviors. But from a fostering standpoint, I couldn't, you could have put, put that, him, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't put yeah, him out yeah. into the world because he would have done something. Now, that dog, excuse me, I don't think was truly unpredictable. No. Yeah. You know no. what I mean? He's just scared. It was very predictable, right? Yeah. And I could uh, have worked with him. And, sure. And he could have made it more predictable and improved on it and stuff like that. But, but you know, just like a lot yeah, of dogs. But yeah. couldn't guarantee that the home that he was going to go into would keep up with the same formula that he needed to succeed. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. unfortunately, we had to make the very tough decision sure. to euthanize him and that was the best decision he was a miserable dog yeah Yeah. and and that goes into the conversation that behavioral issues particularly aggression and stuff Mm -hmm. are relationship problems right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's what relationship you have with that dog yeah you know and that will dictate where and when they do it now that also proves that those behaviors are learned behaviors. Mm-hmm. They're not mm-hmm. genetic miswirings. Yeah. Because they can turn it on and off based on their relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> oh, an interesting, I think a, a way to put it into a human perspective is I don't know if you, the serial killer gene. That mm-hmm. people have. I mean, it's a real, it's a, it's a real the like serial gen- killer gene. Yeah, it's a genetic trait that shows like that people, lots of people have, sure. like millions what? of people. Yeah, uh, you just are more inherent to be aggressive, but um, not everybody's out killing people mm-hmm, that yeah. have that gene. Or like mental health issues, the broad spectrum. Yeah. I mean, he, the human world is. You can have all sorts of anxiety disorders. Is that present in dogs? Is it studied enough to be like mm-hmm. this dog has? this anxiety disorder yeah. mm-hmm. if you go to, it's an actual it's Should an actual I, thing they put it in some show and that's why it comes up see that. Yeah. i never want to get H-130. tested for that no if i'm a serial killer well it's i mean it's just one of those things it's just it, it's really more about upbringing and stuff mm-hmm. like yeah. that you know it's not Nature just versus nurture yeah how, how accurate is it that if you have that gene or if you're a serial killer you have that gene a lot of them have it oh yeah mm-hmm. my god 
But it's just, it, and yeah, they don't, you know, because like that was a thing a while ago. They were like mm-hmm. trying to say that, but I mean, there's mil- there's literally millions of people that just you have it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's your genetic code. It doesn't mean you're gonna go out and just be like. I just want to kill people. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it doesn't work that way. I fight that urge all, every mm-hmm. day. Though. But I mean, that, that's just one, one way of like thinking about it in a human standpoint that, I mm-hmm. mean, genetics do play a role in how you react yeah. and things, but mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that yeah. you're going to be aggressive or mm-hmm. you're going to be yeah. this type of like, yeah. you know, screws loose or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like there's usually a huge breakdown yeah. There are outliers, obviously. Like, yeah. But like you said, like in the grand scheme, okay, you you mentioned two dogs out of how many dogs have you trained in the last three years? Hundreds and hundreds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know? So yeah, there are going to be some, but it's definitely not near as prevalent as it seems to be made so, out yeah. to be. So the, the gene is... Um, okay. So so <laughs> the gene breaks like, down <laughs> serotonin, epinephrine, no repinephrine, and dopamine. <laughs> I don't know how to say any of those. <laughs> These neurotransmitters regulate mood, emotion, and the body's response to stress, among other functions. Uh, since abnormalities in the gene can result in aggressive behavior, the Mawa gene has been called the warrior gene. Interesting. So it's not, I mean, all it does is it, it, it basically yeah. inhibits your ability to control your emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, right? So you okay. act more sporadic. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. That yeah. makes it like, seem less like yeah. everyone's yeah, it's not, a serial killer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah which it's makes not, sense. I mean, there yeah. are some people that you meet that just cannot handle their emotions, right? Yeah. People that just like lose their mm-hmm. shit. Or like right? anger issues, anger management yeah. classes, yeah. things like that. Yeah. I, but, would, I would probably agree that there's something like this in dog that when you start getting into like screws mm-hmm. loose and stuff, I'm sure that, I mean, again, it's genetic. There are certain genes that are different or present themselves or are not there mm-hmm. or something like that um, that cause them to act more erratic like that. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I think there's too much blame. Not everyone's a serial killer. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, there's just too much too much blame on genetics, mm-hmm. you know, sure. yeah. than there should be. Mm-hmm. I, I think we use it as an excuse to say that we can't control things, Yeah, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We use it as an excuse for poor behavior from dogs and from people. Yeah. A lot of people are like, oh, my dog's really unpredictable. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. but you just predicted the situation your dog does that in. (laughs) 100%. I love when I'm talking to people and they tell me about all their unpredictable instances and I'm able to outline to them, this is why this is predictable. Well, they're literally telling you the situation too. And I'm like, that was predictable. Yeah. 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 Or using their dog's past as an excuse for current behaviors, (laughs) which is my mom is very guilty. (laughs) Oh, I don't know Benny's Mm -hmm. past. Victimizing their dog. He was in a hoarding situation. (laughs) And when Benny barks, he's remembering that time (laughs) four years ago when he was in a crate. And it's just like, don't you dare like put that on your Does Toonie remember being in a crate with her dead sibling? Toonie doesn't remember what she (laughs) ate for breakfast. (laughs) You know, one of my favorite memes is out there. The one of the chihuahua with like the war pictures and stuff in the background. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talking about it. (laughs) That's my favorite. Flashbacks. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) Vietnam flashbacks. It's like shell shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like, of course, it can affect development like in young dogs or any age, but it's not an excuse for current Mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You got a short one on there? Um, Yeah. So a video I was watching recently scrutinizing a balance trainer on TikTok. This positive only trainer said balance, good balance training is is based on reward in building confidence, emotional stability, and knowing how to teaching your dog to know how to win. A foundation on punishment is rarely going to be effective. If you punish a dog without showing them what you to do first, you're you are creating issues. So that so so again, the generalized statements of you're creating issues and it doesn't work is not true mm-hmm. uh, because it does work. We have training programs that I mean, our one on one sessions are kind of built around punishment and then the rewards come secondary to it and they work. Right. Mm-hmm. We have success with it, obviously. Would I prefer to do it the other way around? Yes. And that's why, like I said earlier, like if I could train a dog in the perfect order, yes, I would spend the time teaching everything first, then uh, proofing it all later Mm -hmm. on with punishment and negative reinforcement. Um, But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the dogs are not conducive to that. They're not Mm -hmm. motivated enough. We don't have enough time with them, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think balanced training is utilizing both of them efficiently enough. I think you start getting into, again, with the spectrum conversation, at what point is it no longer balanced? 
right? Mm. You know, like I think there are some people that it's just e collar training and prong collar training that call themselves balanced trainers. Yeah, you're not a balanced. Well, trainer, what are you right? calling yourself if you don't have positive? If you're not using rewards, uh, negative n- trainer. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I don't know. Positive only trainer. Negative only trainer. Yeah. Negative negative only trainer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But no one's going to say that. Yeah, I've Compulsion that. based trainer, I think, is technically mm. the term a lot of people uh, will yeah. use. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, which compulsion trace. <laughs> compulsion based training works. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's not balanced training. Yeah. And I would say, you know, a lot of our one on ones we do are compulsion based. Yeah. Good majority of them, probably, you know, <clears throat> where I would say that our uh, board and train program is truly balanced. Yeah. We really try mm-hmm. to balance it as much mm-hmm. as we can, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. I think that's but true. I think that yeah I mean I, I don't think that saying it doesn't work is yeah. correct you could say I, you know again looking at these things I prefer not to do it this way mm-hmm. is fine I would be far more accepting of it that but I hate these blanket statements of this is wrong mm-hmm. right um can you make a separate TikTok of yourself like um debunking all these quotes you're seeing on TikTok from other trainers yeah, yeah. I would watch that okay <laughs> yeah, I'll get, I'll get right on. Good work, Bridget. Have your own podcast. I would, if I made a TikTok and someone commented negative mean things on it, I'd just <laughs> cry. So. I remember. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, cool. This is good. Yeah. We'll wrap that up on that. Good point. It looks like you got a lot more. Do you have a lot more still? No. She has a whole nother. Pa- don't you no, have we one went one? through. The, she, would change, she turned this the page. One, yeah, oh. I turned the page. Oh. But How many more do you have? No. it. Um, the only other thing is... When that Petco fiasco was going on, yeah, yeah, yeah. when Petco removed e collars sure. from their store, um, a certain shelter in the area, everyone I knew from that shelter was blowing up about how evil e collar use. Sure. And this one girl in particular said, using an e collar is shocking dogs to get them to listen to you. Uh-huh. And I was like, how? they're hype words. Yeah. Shock. Shocking. Like, abusive mm-hmm. you know like there's all these words that make things sound worse than they are mm-hmm. punishment punishment no whatever. punishment for dogs no consequences for mm-hmm. anything yeah you know in the end of the day there's gonna that world is gonna be there right mm-hmm. i think you're in an interesting position because you're kind of sitting between the two worlds mm-hmm. you know uh and i think that that takes a very emotionally strong person mm-hmm. because it's going to force you to question yourself which is good mm-hmm. like we talked about at the beginning but it's also going to put you in a position where you're going to catch a lot of abuse mm-hmm. from the possible <laughs> they're going to abuse you um but uh yeah it's going it's going to put you in a position where they're they're going to really try to feed into that but you're you going to get questions like that even from clients and stuff yeah. too how do you use the e collar mm-hmm. why do you guys use the e collar whatever mm-hmm. and i think like being in that position helps you question it so you have an answer for like people like that and stuff mm-hmm. too. And seeing mm-hmm. how it works in my own personal life with mm-hmm. my personal dogs. Mm-hmm. Like I would never be able to have the recall reliability with Spork and Minnow that I do if I hadn't used the e-caller mm-hmm. with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I get it, but you know, we'll have a competition one day. Find the best local positive only trainer and <laughs> we'll have a train off. We'll yeah. all adopt a new puppy and take it there. Oh yeah. God! There's or that, a rescue like with a the, broken um, path. Snapchat mm-hmm. filter on Miracle is for another dog training company. Still, um, if you're at Miracle and you swipe through your location, it says um, North Coast Dog. Oh. North Coast Dogs. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, yeah, North That's Coast Dogs. Who used had to the be, uh, They were the original place at our. Actually, oh. it was in the dog house. Used to be at our facility. Mm-hmm. Uh, North Coast Dogs is at our facility. Then it was High Drive Pups, Roxana's place. Oh. Then it was us. Wow, I didn't know it was so many dog places. A lot of dog places. Yep. Mm. So. Cool. Oh, well. Good chats, guys. Mm-hmm. Debunking TikTok. <laughs> Debunking. Uh, questions? Anyway, anything? Last points? I'm good. No. <clears throat> I'm good. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah. us. Sure thing. <laughs> um, I'm not going to make them share their handles. Nobody wants to know them. What? They might want to know her. They don't want to know her anymore because <laughs> she got rid of her Instagram. You could still follow me. I'll accept followers. Oh, okay. Krista, what's your, where are they going to find you? Where are the people going to find you? <laughs> Krista's canines. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Wow. Turning Bridget. tiny dogs. I better come back where my Instagram blew up when I get it back on my phone. Mm. It never blows. This podcast can make you famous, Krista. 
Yeah. Um, good. Uh, Doobie? <clears throat> uh, Josh Dobey Productions. Josh Dobey Productions.com. Fine, is it? Okay, I agree. <laughs>